like. Ignoring us. Good go. The public is ignoring us. Good. Good evening and welcome to Thursday, September 24th, 2015's regular meeting of the Hoppington School Committee. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So I'll quickly run through our agenda. We'll start with recognitions. Then we'll move on to public comments, then reports to the school committee. We'll have the student council report, an ESBC report with a communications plan, liaison report, school committee chair report, and the superintendent's report. Then we'll move into new business where we have the joint capital project with the town um, payment and then another payment for the capital project school department article warrant 16013 and a budget transfer request. With old business, we will have the middle school Washington, D.C. trip, school committee policy IHBG, and school committee policy JF. Then we'll have our second chance for public comment, followed by items by consensus. And tonight we'll move into executive session after that to discuss contract negotiations with non-union personnel. With respect to the superintendent, also to review executive session minutes for release and to discuss updates with respect to the collective bargaining with the HTA. So we'll start with recognition. So um, can I, I know we briefly discussed it. Can I just request one alteration to the sure. agenda? And that is to reorder um, the new building project presentation up ahead of the ESBC report because I think that the discussion of the communications plan will have a lot more context after the presentation. Is anyone opposed? Okay, so we'll make that move, that change in the agenda. And now we'll move to recognitions. Dr. McCod? Sure, I'll begin. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to recognize um, just a wonderful weekend that took place in our community um, around the 300th anniversary. Uh, people cannot stop talking about what a good time that they had. Um, and, and also how just everything fell kind of came together so beautifully, including the weather that blessed us. We were expecting it to rain, I think, all weekend long, and it held off, held off, held off. So um, I think everybody, I know everybody was there and was part of it, but I wanted to make sure that we didn't let that <coughs> go away without recognizing it, and particularly recognizing you, Jean. Um, you know, you're part of our committee, and we work very closely with you, but in addition to that work, um, you know, your work was so integral, and you were not going to let this go. Um, and you were going to make sure that the town had a fa fantastic party. And I was a little alarmed when I heard somebody say, let's do this every year. And I was like, what? <laughs> what? what? <laughs> so, um, because I know from working with you, particularly throughout the summer, how, how many hours and hours and hours you were putting into it. So thank you for uh, giving the, the um, town such a wonderful, wonderful party. Well, thank you. That's very nice of you. I have to say the schools were, I mean, it's a perfect spot to have it. And um, Al Rogers and his whole cast of thousands was uh, was phenomenal to work with. But the most, I think, the thing that, that was the best for all of us was just to see all the kids there and the looks on the faces. And, you know, that's that's what everybody put the time in for. And hopefully somebody that was <laughs> here <laughs> and under the age of 15 will step forward in 50 years and do it again. So thank you all very much for coming. It, was, it worked out very well. Thanks. I was going to nominate you to be on the fun committee and have it every five years at least. No? I would enjoy attending it. And oh. I'm happy to share my notes. Happy to share. I'll be okay. consult. I'll consult. We have no one here for public comment. And so we will move on to the reports to the school committee and um, there's no one here from student council so we will move into the new building project presentation hello and we have mike shepherd joining us so um evening, you know you are the very first first of the road show um there's simultaneous road shows going on tonight we call it the road show um because those of us who work together so closely with the elementary school building committee um, we are two representatives of it, um, and we're very excited about the opportunities over the next four to five weeks 
um, numerous opportunities to speak to many, many different groups of people. Uh, Mike and I are here representing the ESVC um, to run through the presentation that's going to be happening multiple times. And you've been provided with a copy of the also with the talking points. Because as school committee members, um, I, we wanted to make sure that you're comfortable if you're approached um, in terms of questions about the, the building and the, and the project, that you have all the information at your fingertips to answer um, the, with all the information. So you have the talking points as well. But tonight at the center school, um, Joe Markey and Lauren Dubow are meeting with the Moms Mark. Club at this very same time. Absolutely. So um, this is our first run through, Mike. That's it's right. always a pleasure to work with you. And we've got TV tomorrow. Uh, yes, we so do. So when I will be putting a, uh, a thing on the HCAM, which will uh, televise over at least once a week over the next four or five weeks. Uh, the building committee got together and, and decided, we, always through the whole process, we tried to keep everybody involved through the, through the uh, forums we had and, and announcement and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, but we recognize there are some people that um, may not you know, be aware of what's happening. And we have this important town meeting coming up and there's the vote subsequent to that. Um, so we decided we'd recognize all the various groups in town and ask to be invited and speak before the groups and hope to hit as, as many people as we could to get the information out. And, and this is a kind of a package uh, thing. So, so uh, like, as Kathy says, you, you folks are the first ones to hear this thing. Um, so how do you want to do this? I'll do you the first few pages. Yeah. All right. Um, Can I ask a quick question? about the groups and how they were identified and if someone is part of a group and they want you to come speak, who do yes, they contact? In, in, in fact, um, you could notify Joe Markey or myself or Kathy or John or anybody. Right, and um, and back uh, probably a year and a half ago, we sent letters out to everybody. Uh, Den Mothers got letters. Everybody got letters. And it was asked for, you know, to be invited to speak to them and let them know what we were doing. We got pretty good response for that. Um, this time um, we have a little bit shorter time frame, and we have a little, you know, we have a little bit of the education curve behind us. So we're hitting all the big ones. We thought it was important to be a, the moms group, especially because that's the target audience. Um, the, but um, the the uh, the chamber, the you know, all the groups, and, and uh, if if you know of anyone, just let us know, and, and we'd be happy to come to them. Thanks. We'll come to people's homes. We're going to water fresh. Whatever you need. We're, we're partnering with a lot of these organizations. So, for example, the Moms Group actually opened theirs up to anyone tonight. Um, and we are going to be hosting an open public forum on, I forget what date we finalized, October the 14th. So that if, when your organization, whatever organization you belong to, if you can't make that or if you're not um, a member of anyone in particular, this is another option that's open to it. But this was a sort of a targeted opportunity for us. Yeah. And we recognize that the presentation will hopefully generate questions and, and interests, and we're prepared to answer those as well. And, uh, so we'll get started. For the past two and a half years, we've been volunteering on the elementary school building committee. We were formed in March of 2013 by the Board of Selectmen and the school committee to a clear mission statement. That was to facilitate the development of a proposed solution to the operational and educational constraints of the center school that will be supported by the voters of Hopkins as well as the MSBA. Uh, you can see the members listed here. Each brings <clears throat> such unique and different perspective from their place in the Hopkins community. Each has put in many, many hours and effort and their commitment has served Hopkins well. I'd like to talk next about our operating principles rooted in transparency, openness, and communication. Um, as an aside, we, we, when, when we started uh, the, the whole process, we spent a lot of time looking at the last um, uh, school building uh, thing that failed. And we looked at all the, the um, uh, thing, items that people posted in the interest, and we, we studied that very carefully to make sure that if there were mistakes, we didn't make the same one. So, um, so we were appointed to serve the community needs and your needs. This is a public project and as such sharing information and setting a high standard for transparency and, and accountability is critical. From the beginning we've said we want not only to meet the minimum legal requirement for information sharing but we want to far exceed it. To set a new high standard of transparency 
and community engagement. Over the past year, we've held four community workshops on evenings and weekends, mostly in snowstorms, <laughs> <coughs> where you helped us craft our site evaluation criteria, choose a location for the new school, inspect and develop the educational program, and review an early draft of the schematic design and the state recently approved, that the state recently approved. These have all been heavily promoted and televised. In addition, our regular meetings have been held in the studios of HCAM TV, aired live and replayed on local cable access channels. We even cooperated with HCAM to create a new monthly program on HCAM TV called the ESBC Update. In addition to our televised meetings, <clears throat> where we provide updates to HCAM staff that are broadcast on the website and local cable access TV. These have aired each month since 2013. We've tried to be <clears throat> thorough and methodical in our work, and we've shared the output as we develop it with each of you in the community, in, in the workshops, and at each town meeting since 2013. In addition, we've maintained energy and active focus to keep updating the project website, the Facebook page, Twitter account, and provide HCAM TV updates over the past two years. When it came time to evaluate site alternatives, we developed a thorough and methodical review and analysis of the sites. We shared them with you at town meeting and through the various communication vehicles. Why do we do all this? Because this is your solution, the townspeople of Hockett. We were appointed by the community to serve the community's needs. We are people like you, volunteering for you. You have the final say. For those reasons, we felt it would be smart to have you involved from the beginning and throughout the process. That way, with us, you could craft a solution that you'll ultimately vote on this fall. And we thank you for staying engaged, inspecting our work, and providing your input. You've helped craft and improve the outcome. Working with the Massachusetts School Building Authority has been constructive. The MSBA works with cities and towns across the Commonwealth and brings a wealth of expertise. Building a new school with the MSBA is a highly regulated process with checkpoints, inspections, and iterations at every step. This has helped Hopkinton benefit from experience from other districts, avoided common pitfalls while avoiding unnecessary costs. We've also had the benefit of selecting a very <coughs> experienced project team with DRA architects and Compass Project Management. <coughs> the project timeline. By now, this timeline should look familiar. Uh, Joe. The chair of the committee presented this at the very first time meeting over two years ago, but we were way by on the left of the, the arrow. Um, over the past few years, we presented it at each town meeting, each workshop, each joint meeting with the selectmen. We would like to point out the numerous checkpoints with the MSBA where the work was inspected, improved, and, and improved and approved at each step. It is highly regulated process and ensures the best outcome for communities like Hopkinton. In addition to the MSBA inspections, we have invited your inspection at every step as well. We are now at the critical phase leading up to a community vote on a special town meeting on October 26th and a town election to be held on November 9th. <clears throat> we looked at several families of options back at the beginning stages. Over the course of several community walk workshops, you helped us evaluate various configurations within four families of site alternatives. First, we wanted to fully and thoroughly explore the center school site, including uh, the property at the back and even the adjacent private property. Next, we wanted to examine the Elmwood site uh, as a possibility since the town already owns the property and we saw it as a possible consolidation opportunity. Uh, there are also two <coughs> private properties on Hayden Road Street, close to the existing main campus. The site evaluation and selection was a rigorous process, and your involvement helped us to craft the criteria and make the best decision for Paul Hopkinson. In the end, after a rigorous evaluation and inspection, 
we unanimously decided the Irvine property at 135 Hayden Road <coughs> is the best site. It offers the best flexibility for future expansion. It's adjacent to the EMC Park and other advantages and was free of critical limitations some of the other sites had. Our meeting authorized acquisition of the Irvine property in May of this year. Over the summer, the elementary school building committee met nearly weekly uh, in public meetings to develop the schematic design for the Hayden Rose site. This solution will meet Hopkins educational program for pre-K through first grade well into the future. Now we'll hear from the educational leaders about what will happen inside the new building. Lots educational of fun. Educational leaders. I am here to represent that. We're really excited. It's been really um, a learning curve for me to learn about everything that goes in. I had no idea. This is the first time I've worked on this kind of a project. So when I see that timeline, I, I kind of went, wow, because it's flown by. Um, and the fun part was this past spring and summer when we, um, Lauren and I, got to meet with, with the architects down to the choosing of, you know, pieces of furniture. Um, in each building, in each classroom. And it was really great because one of the things that we learned in working with the MSBA is the uniqueness, the very uniqueness of this project. Um, they're excited, you know, the person that has been assigned to work with us in the next stage is like, oh, this is such an exciting project because of its very uniqueness. And I want to stretch, stretch, stress the uniqueness because the very design of the building provides a specific environment for little people. This is not a building that could could be used, you know, for anything other than that, with its little toilets and sinks and every room. Um, but more important is the educational program. What is going on? And when we designed the space, we had conversations about things like teachers' desks. Well, teachers' desks in kindergarten rooms have to be easily moved because they move their classrooms around constantly to facil facilitate the type of teaching that goes on in those spaces. Um, so we want to meet the specific needs of our youngest learners and specifically and particularly around literacy skills that, that's so unique to this population because it's taught across the content areas. So this particular picture is showing, showing um, it looks like you know, the kids are cooking and measuring and math, and, but there's also literacy embedded in this. And the classroom space you can see behind the kidney table, we talk about everybody values the kidney tables because that's the teaching space where teachers will pull small groups of kids in a way that they don't do, you know, in middle school, high school, you see this happening. Um, but while the teacher is working, you know, it, well, you've all, you've all had little kids. So while the teacher is working with a group of kids with common learning needs, there are engaging centers going on in four other places across the classroom. Um, and often multiple teachers or paraprofessionals or in a co-taught classroom, a special educator. So we needed to design a space that would really lend itself to that type of learning environment. Um, the next slide, um, really we talk about the core values. So you've heard me talk about this over and over again, the focus on early intervention, differentiation, inclusion, and prevention. So if we differentiate early, and if we provide opportunities for students um, early where we know that they're struggling or maybe they're behind, then we're preventing bigger problems down the road. And one of the really exciting things that we'll, we'll talk to briefly when we get to the actual design was they designed in this building spaces where students can meet together with common needs in the hallway. But it's not really a hallway, it's kind of tucked off to the side, but designed in a way that kind of interrupts the flow of traffic so that it's not this long corridor of 12 classrooms, rather it's six. We're going to talk about a neighborhood later, but six classrooms and then interrupted by this little jog, but the little jog is designed for instruction and where light is pouring in and it's engaging for kids. And so um, differentiated small group instruction means that kids, the other thing that we, we have in this building that's so exciting is there's a doorway adjoining every two classrooms between the walls of the two classrooms, intentionally put there to encourage this type of cross-classroom flexible grouping with kids. Shared responsibility for student, student achievement and teachers who can partner for the, the education of 40 kids instead of a teacher being left in isolation for 20. And so now if your students need something and I have a group of matching students, we can, through this doorway, flex students for a period of time 
Um, and it's great for kids too because they get a different environment throughout the day. So the building has been designed in this way and as we shared with the MSBA our vision for the educational program, they then designed the building to match. I'm sorry, not the MSBA, but the architect. Um, and, and it went back and forth through the design portion of this project. Um, the other piece is that teachers plan centers across content areas for small groups. Um, so that when I talked about that small group breakaway, that's for, for ample practice for children. Um, finally, we talk about the inclusiveness of our special education <coughs> program. Um, you can see in this, in this picture, I, I kind of chose this slide because it showed two things. It showed a student working independently, which we, I don't think, often think of when we think about little, little ones. Um, we, want to provide, we want to provide challenges and materials where they can work independently and grow even more confident in their skills. So the child is obviously in a classroom where there's, there's a lot of things going on, but you can see that this child is writing on a clipboard, very engaged in what she's doing, um, because it's something that she can be successful at. So ind independent as well as small group targeted intervention. So on the carpet, what's, ta what's happening there is the teacher has pulled three students. You can see that they have learning mats in front of them. They have a common need. So whether it is that they need additional instruction on a skill that's been taught to the whole class, the teacher through assessments has identified that, oh, they haven't quite mastered, let me pull them for a small group intervention where they get additional instruction. And what's really important is that, well, you can see that they're in the classroom. They're, this is not happening down the hall, where they're missing important instruction that's taking place in the classroom. This is happening within the classroom environment and in the classroom structure. So cooperative learning opportunities, um, peer coaching, and flexible grouping is the really the focus of the educational program, and the building has been designed to meet that philosophy. Uh, so you can tell them. Um, your turn. I, I, let me add s something as well to that. It, and oftentimes in, in the education community, and, and I have an education degree from a long time ago. Most educational programs are, are designed around the facilities you have. And the thing that's about exciting about this project, and the MSBA was adamant about it, is we would design this building around the educational plan. Yeah. Before we had any plans for the building, um, your staff provided an education plan to the MSBA. And the architects, after the MSBA looked at it, took that and designed a school around the plan as opposed to the opposite, mm -hmm. which happens in most cases. Uh, so that's what makes this, this really, really exciting. Um, the, um, the other part is, since we have, and, and you know, some, all of the youngest learners in town, uh, it was important from everybody's perspective to make sure they had a, a sense of community and, and they, they were um, uh, a sense of security. And so what they did is they, they designed this school uh, so it had a sense of community uh, where you know, the classrooms where the, the kids of, of, you know, similar grade levels were in, in different areas, like, like little neighborhoods, for, for example. Um, the, the office was the place like you would have in the town hall where the, the administration takes place. The cafeteria is a place where they all gather and, and, and they eat and they, they do what kids do. And the library as well is similar. And the school was kind of designed around that concept. Um, it, it was not an isolated compound. The, the school is integrated part of the Hopkins community. It's not isolated, but something the whole community can be proud of and enjoy. The building design will group students by common grade level in neighborhood-like fashion to facilitate shared responsibility and sense of community. And, and I want to put this out because I, I was probably the, the reason we don't have sinks over there in uh, the Hopkins school. Because I was on that building committee too. Uh, these, these classrooms all have sinks and the lower grade levels all have toilet facilities in the classroom. The first grade kids learn to go to first grade places. Uh, just to make that clear, they will have sinks, they will have toilet facilities. Um, encouraging community participation is a core value within our educational community. We want to create a warm and welcoming environment for the students, and the community involvement extends beyond the school day and the school year and the grade level span. The, we, we look and, and we're trying to make the school um, <clears throat> something that the whole community can enjoy, the, old, the whole community can be proud of, 
and the whole community can utilize in one way or another. While the school building directly serves pre K, K, and first grade, the site layout and design have been done in a way to achieve direct benefits to a broader community as well. Uh, its location is directly adjacent to EMC Park. The distance from the playground to the park to the door of the school is about from here to those doors at the end of this room. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the theory is that when in, in the spring and, and, and summer when the, they have baseball at EMC Park and we've all gone down there to watch our kids and grandkids and had no place to park, there'd be an opportunity to park at the school and walk over to the park. And the inverse is true as well. When there are things like tonight um, yeah. at the, the school and nobody can find a place to park, of course they'll have the opportunity to park at EMC Park and they'll have a lighted pathway that goes down to the school. Uh, a word about the lighted pathway, it's, it's also an emergency egress for a fire and rescue, but it won't have normal traffic as you and I would expect, but it will be able to com accommodate emergency vehicles, which is just makes the sound judgment uh, thing to do. Um, on mornings when parents may walk or stroll their children to school, they may use the MC Park to drop off or pick up. They can park at the MC Park parking lot. We've, we've met uh, two, on two occasions with the park and recreation, and they're excited about not only um, what having the school here can provide for the parks and recreation community, but also what they can do for us as well. Um, can I jump in for a minute? Yes, ma'am. So I want to also add that the building has been designed so that the, the central, the, the access point for the community can be locked off from the rest of the building. And so that again is intentional so that we're really encouraging community use on a night like tonight if we were, if there were people coming in to access the media center, the gym, the cafetorium, they wouldn't have access to classrooms, hallways. It, it, those areas can be closed off so that we're inviting access to the parts of the building that have been designed to be shared. The other piece that we've been talking about is the importance of having an air-conditioned space that all programs can use throughout the summer months. Um, and that is not limited to school programs. So that, that's limited to, you know, town-wide programs that people might want to use the facilities for, educational programs, um, non-educational um, activities that might be using the, the, the gym. Truly looking at a facility that can be used by um, the community. And that's something that we want to really stress as we're sharing the plan, that this is not only being designed for pre-K-1, it's being designed, intended to be a community resource with meeting rooms, et, et cetera, that can be used year round. Yeah, and some may look at the air conditioning as a, uh, an extravagance, but we looked at it very carefully. And because the building is a lead building, it's, it's, very, it's going to be constructed uh, um, to conserve energy. And we think that, you know, we can air condition it uh, at little or no extra cost because it'll maintain the temperature much better than, for instance, trying to air condition this building. It'll be designed for air conditioning. Um, and if anything, after this summer, you could see why it might be, might be uh, even in September, when the kids the first couple of weeks having air conditioning would be a lot better than what we have now. Um, next slide, please. Now, the exterior, um, to give you a little bit of grounding, this is of course off Hayden Road Street, and it's down, the entrance is down the area of Hilltop Road, and as you may recall, if you go back down that way towards Charles View, on the left hand side there's an old gent there that has a pile of wood out there that says firewood for sale. That is the entrance to the school. Um, the entrance, <coughs> we were very careful about uh, making it a triple wide entrance because not only do we figure that this entrance will serve the school, but it will also serve other town needs as well. And to, to get back to, you know, one of the points that was brought up at you know, one of the last town meeting and one before about the loop road, it is anticipated that this road will be a public road up to the entrance, the very entrance to the school that you see in the lower right hand of the picture. The rest of it will be public. It will all, they're all main made by the town, but when it has to be paved, they'll do it and the school won't be responsible for it. Um, but you drive up, and the school buses peel off to the right and go behind. That, what you see is a solar display up there, and on the right-hand side, you can barely see the tops of the school buses. And that's the pick-up and drop-off. And the next slide will show it more clearly. But the that's right there. 
and the main entrance is over to the left. The area on the back that's shaded blue is a play area, and also the area on the front is a play area. The, um, the, um, <coughs> we changed the, the, the glass in the elevation and, and provided more glass than the architects wanted originally um, because there was some concern by a lot of people that there, there wasn't enough glass and, and, and of course the architect said there isn't enough wall to hang stuff on so we want less glass. <laughs> so we, we reached a compromise and we have fairly wide windows so there'll be a lot of glass. It's a two-story building as you can see. Um, the back portion, which is the cafeteria, cafetorium and the, the uh, gymnasium are two stories high. The balance of the building is two full floors. The, um, <clears throat> you can, next slide, please. Hey, Mike. Sorry, yep. can I make one note? So you had mentioned the three lanes of entrance. I think the imp another important note about that is the reason why it's, it's three lanes wide is that the middle lane is a, is, is basically going to switch directions. Yep. So on the, in the morning, that is a lane that will be enter allowing traffic into the building where we anticipate the most traffic will be coming in and prevent cars and or buses from queuing up onto Hayden Row, which has been a concern that people have raised. In the afternoon, that middle lane switches, like if anybody's ever been on like the Tappan Zee Bridge, <laughs> switches directions going in and out. Um, that will be an egress lane so that we don't have traffic queuing up for people exiting b buses and cars. So intentionally designed that way, to uh, eliminate the queuing that could occur on, on Hayden Row, as we've seen at some of the other school buildings. The, uh, also, it, it may be time to interject, and this is fairly new material. The, the budget includes uh, crosswalks out of Hayden Row Street, uh, traffic signals out of Hayden Row Street. There's a right turn into the school. The, 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 the street becomes three lanes wide at the school entrance. There's a right turn into the school. If you're coming from this direction, there's a left turn only into the school. All that part of the reconfigure at Hayden Road Street is within the budget. It's limited to that range with the entrance. Um, always, also in anticipation that the town is going to utilize the balance of the site for other uses and need that um, traffic. Um, so the first floor is mostly the younger learners and administration. Um, the the cafeteria, of course, is that circular or cafetorium is that circular item up there on the upper right. The gymnasium is to, to the right of that. Uh, we didn't go crazy on the gymnasium. Like By crazy, I mean we didn't include a lot of bleachers and things that you'd normally find in gyms, like the brown gym back here. Uh, this was a gym for the kids, and occasionally it could be used for parents for basketball at night, but the assumption is nobody wants to watch those guys play anyway. But uh, so, so the bleachers are not, you know, really in the in the budget. Um, the classrooms are the dark blue areas on the left and again the, the, the first floor pre-k and k kids all have toilet facilities within the classrooms as well as sinks. Uh, but those are the those are the neighborhoods that, that um, Kathy was talking about. The lighter areas between the blocks that kind of break up the hallway instead of a straight long hallway are those little learning areas that are kind of off the classrooms that can be used for common space, that kind of breakout areas. Administration in the front, the main entrance is down to just a little bit lower, the, the arrow coming up from right, right there is the main entrance. Um, and the school buses come in the other side. Over, um, so as you can see, they come into a vestibule that can be locked down. The school buses come in that way. The school is set up so we can isolate the classrooms at night so the public will have no entry to the classrooms, but they will have entry to the media center, the library, and the, and the cafetorium, um, and gym. And that way, uh, the custodial staff won't go crazy with people traipsing all over, and, and hopefully it will reduce costs. Um, and it had a lot to do with security. This, the second floor is the, again, the, these are the big kids, the first graders. <laughs> and uh, the, the uh, Pretty much the only part that is on the second floor is the media center and the first grade classrooms. Um, the cafetorium is, is taller. We, we talked a lot about that in terms of um, we thought this should be part of the learning experience. And the taller cafetorium, give, you know, because the space is big and it's round, if you ended up one story tall, it would feel confining, kind of like this space does. By making it two floors tall, we talked about the, the potential for having, you know, 
crazy stuff like like trees and birds and not not real birds, but stuff in that space that the kids, first graders, would really really go for, and again be part of the educational experience. Um, the uh, the gymnasium is a gymnasium. You can't build a one floor gymnasium. So you know the, the uh, but, but that's pretty pretty much what it is. And uh, budget. The, uh, you, you can read through, through this thing, and the, the important things to take away from the budget, of course, is the bottom line. And, and uh, I, I have to stress that through this whole process, we work through the MSBA. The community has an option to go on it by themselves, and the MSBA reimburses you zero. And, you know, we'd be looking at a number like, you know, $45 million. By working with the MSBA, and it, it's been a lot of work. Um, you know, we've attended a lot of meetings in Boston. We've submitted a lot of information. They've submitted, they've sent a lot of information back. But finally, in our last meeting about three weeks ago, we sat down with them. And they said, "Okay, this is how much we can give the town," and they decided it was in the magnitude of like 44 and a half percent reimbursement. Now they don't reimburse everything. That's, that's why their reimbursement comes out comes down to about fourteen million dollars of the the forty three point two million dollar uh, budget. Uh, so the town's share is twenty nine million one hundred and seventy thousand um, dollars, and and but what we have to do is we have to appropriate the whole number. The MSBA, kind of like everything else, sends us checks as we go down through the process. And eventually, we'll only spend 29170 but um, the MSBA will reimburse us the rest. The important thing to note from the meeting three weeks ago is the MSBA was really excited because our, our package was thorough. The package wasn't overly done. We don't have crazy stuff in there. So they were really excited about it. And it's important to stress that the partnership of the MSBA has been a positive one. And, um, I assume it will be the same going through the rest of the process. So that's the number, 29170. Can I ask you a question about something you said about the um, reimbursement part? So once the MSBA has promised Hockington yep. that percentage of reimbursement, regardless of budget changes in Massachusetts, is that number set? Like the town gets that it? That number is set. Now, the only thing, that, their number won't change. The, the town could do crazy stuff and add a million dollars to it for something that you know, is unexpected. They won't cover that. They right. won't give us a percentage of that. Uh, this, is a, this is an agreement, and it, the meeting takes place what, in a couple of weeks, the official yeah. meeting. Next week, 30th. And, yeah, it's, it's called the Scope and Budget Agreement, and the agreement is just that. This is how much you'll spend. This is how much we'll give you. Uh, they, 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 they won't go if we have a benefactor decides to give us $5 million, the MSBA won't, they'll, they'll probably take $5 million. So that's how it works. They try to be fair across the whole state, all 361 communities, I think. But um, they've, they've been really good to work with. But they, again, there are things they don't reimburse. They don't reimburse, um, um, for example, if, if we redid an older school and you get into you know, nasty materials, they won't reimburse for that. And, you know, those are costs that the town usually has to bear. If you get it on a site and you have nothing but giant boulders, they'll, they'll reimburse up to a certain point, but beyond that, the town has to bear that. So it's a budget, and we're going to stick to it. And the number that we're tied into it won't be exceeded on our part. Um, if anything, if something comes in over budget, we'll just have to eliminate something. And, and uh, you know, we. we we won't eliminate the important stuff, but the, uh, the sinks. Pardon? Leave hmm. the sinks. <laughs> yeah. We'll leave the sinks. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, uh, all right. These are the dates. Uh, the next, oh, the sorry. project schedule. Did I yeah. skip a page. I'm sorry. Yeah. The um, so. We've been going through design development, and that'll continue into 2016. That's that green shaded area. Um, the, the, we have schematic drawings, and they look for all the world like plans. They, they have front elevation sides. They have floor plans. They have all that. Um, those are used roughly by the MSBA to determine costs. And also, we went to two independent estimators to get a ballpark price to build this school. 
Um, and that's how we got the number that the MSBA backed up. Now we've got to build the real, real plans. These are, these are the schematics. The building won't change a whole lot, but they'll, they'll have specific designs around structural seal, the plumbing, the HVA system, the, all that. And the set of plans, which is now probably a quarter of an inch thick, will morph into something an inch and a half thick. That, those are the construction documents. Um, so through, the, through probably this time next year, we'll get the construction documents out. And then we'll go out to bid, and we'll start to do some site work and foundation works in the fall of next year. Um, the main project will start at the same time. And construction is about a year and a half. And we've worked to make sure that we hit the September 2018 date, and we'll work backwards from that. So we're, 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 we're going to hit the date. And everything has worked up to that. That was a lot of the thing around the requirement for a special town meeting, because you know if we put it off any further, we weren't going to hit the date. Everything is very critical in terms of the amount of time each each step takes. Um, so that was the schedule. Um, the funding um, <clears throat> is very important. Nothing will happen without the vote of the community on October 26th at a special town meeting. Um, there is some discussion amongst you folks, and if you could help, it would be great. I anticipate there'd be a big turnout for town meeting. Maybe bigger than could be accommodated at the middle school auditorium, and we were talking about perhaps doing it at the high school, what do we call that place? Athletic Center. Athletic Center. I was going to say gymnasium. I didn't want to misspeak. But uh, we want to make sure it's enough to accommodate everybody, and, uh, because I suspect there'll be a lot of interest. And then... Everybody, that if, if it passes by a two-thirds vote, there'd be a regular ballot question on the 9th of November, and that has to have just a simple majority. But it's important, and we'll try to trust everybody that we talked to that we got to hit both of those things. That just because it passed the town meeting doesn't mean it will pass at the ballot. And uh, we're trying to uh, get everybody involved right now. And the next slide shows all the places that uh, Rob has got us out there in the public's eye, and uh, we'll would like to answer any questions you may have. And we'd be happy to help. Ah, let me, let me ask you, you, you. Everybody wants to know how much is going to cost the average person. And we've spent uh, a member of the committee and the financial staff up at the town hall spent all of last week putting the numbers together. There are a couple different options for us. Most schools, like this school, the high school, uh, were bonded for 20 years. The state allows you for school projects to bond for 30 years. The selectmen are the ones that make the decision whether we bond for 20 or 30. Obviously, the damage <coughs> over 30 is less than over 20. Um, and it's not a bad idea when you consider um, what money would be worth 30 years from now. Also, um, the, you know, there aren't a lot of people that will even stay in town for the 30 years that will pay that tax burden, you know, you know, because we're so transient. You know, people say 10 or 15 maybe, and, you know, that's it. But I point out that the Santa School that we're replacing is over 85 years old, so I expect this one will be around at least 50, so a 30-year bond is probably not a bad deal. In terms of the number, we, we we don't have the exact number for the average homeowner because we also, we kind of got hit with the perfect storm this year in terms of um, things going on in town that cost money. The last town meeting we approved the library and we approved the DPW building and we bought more land, not just the Irvine land, but we bought the Tsunara land and we bought the Pratt land as well. So <clears throat> all of which has a tax impact. So we want to look at not only what that is, but also what's coming off in terms of tax impact. Like I suspect the, the we'll be paying down pretty shortly the high school. This one's coming off soon too. Yep. Hopkins. And, and so those things, we want to make probably two weeks before town meeting we'll have that number that everybody wants to know. But we absolutely will have the number, what the average cost is going to be. But there's so many variables at this point, 20 years, 30 years, and we don't know exactly, they're working on that now, what's coming off, what's coming on, and so everybody will have a realistic picture. 
The other question is that everybody wants to know is what are we going to do with the Santa School? Uh, the selectmen have, have decided to put together a subcommittee to start to look at the options of the Santa School. Um, because we're realistic in understanding that people are going to say, okay, this is what the school is going to cost, and then the kids will be in the new school, and, and, and what are you going to do with the old school, and how much is that going to cost us? And people in their minds will roll those numbers together. So the selectmen, um, I think, understand the importance of, of getting that resolved sooner rather than later, because uh, we know that's going to have an important impact on how the vote will. I'm sorry, I took all the questions. I, you know, <laughs> you know, I, I, I wanted to get that out because it was important. How can we help? You can help by just talking to your neighbors and, and, uh, Taking all the and encouraging them to, to, to come out, come to town meeting or to partake in any one of these exciting professionally presented Presentation. So, and I don't think we're actually expecting too many questions yeah. from the school committee because no, clearly they you've, been, you've been well informed every step of the way. Um, uh, but we did want to make sure that you heard firsthand what the message was going to be, and yeah. you know if you had any feedback for us. Um, we also wanted to make sure that you had the talking points so that you know what's being said out there in case you are approached. Um, any feedback? I, I have a couple. I mean, I don't know. I don't need to go first. I do first. too, but I don't need to go first. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if there's been any grumbling, so I feel like I wouldn't be the recipient, so I wouldn't know, about, um, I think of the last school projects, and I think, all right, so there was some, like, commingling of issues that sort of really distressed people. Is there anything here that we've heard or that we think people are like, well, I like the plan, but I don't like the location. Is there any really big, like, secondary issues? two issues that we put together that we not, are not worried that, about. Not that we've heard. Um, we, 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 we were very, very careful at the beginning to make sure that we didn't make any of the mis what were perceived as missteps for the first time. Um, the, you know, people are by nature suspicious. And, and, and um, we, we, we drove home the point, and I think everybody's convinced now that you know, this is not a district school. This could not be a district right. school. This is a pre-K and K-1 school. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the MSBA is all the same. The MSBA also followed what happened the last time because we asked them to reimburse us for this one, and they said, no, we're not, because you, we reimbursed you last time. You only get one shot. So the $600,000 that we hoped to get some reimbursement from, they said, no, we're not going to give you any. Um, but um, that's just the way they work. That wasn't just for us. They, they've, been, they've been cooperative through the whole process. We knew that going in. We just kind of hoped they might think since we're good guys, they'd give us some money. They, uh, but uh, we, we haven't heard anything like that. Um, the, um, we, um, um, uh, the it's a question that's come up in a, a couple of our elementary school building committee meetings, and, and that is the general feedback everyone has, and it's fairly sort of diverse committee in terms of the people in which that they interact with. And so, you know, we're, we're not, we're certainly not taking anything for granted with respect to, to getting this passed, and we need to have everybody come out and vote for it, um, but there hasn't been any organized voice that we've heard. No. And that's, and also that's trying to, try to get all the, you know, the, I know, I know Kathy's going to the, the senior center and, and speak to those folks down there and, and uh, we're trying to hit everybody and make it, make them aware of what the need is you know that we're not going crazy on this on the project the schools by their very nature are just expensive and, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they, uh, it, it hopefully will get us through 85 years and somebody will be sitting here in this place hopefully not in this place <laughs> probably not this place and my other comment, and it more, it's more maybe just an idea, and maybe you guys have already thought about it or done it. Um, when I think of families, a lot of times their initial access with the school is their teachers, and is there any plan to give this presentation to teachers, just so they have an under, because when we talk about it being designed around the educational plan, have we made them either feel like they've had input or at least that they've accepted the plan and they're behind it? The architect spent 
two whole days at the center school interviewing every possible role in within the building so that their input from their perspective was taken into consideration within the design um, different people in different roles like you know the, the art teacher and the custodian and every single he was there you know for two whole days and people just trickled through um, and then the ESBC did the same thing in, yeah. in terms of departments and bringing in for the for example the police department you know have we have we thought of everything fire. around security the fire department yeah um, this particular presentation in terms of what it actually looks like at this point I don't think so and I think that's a great suggestion Ellen they might like I mean just yeah. so they feel like yeah. they know what's going to happen where yeah. they're going and yeah we were we were involved and here it is that's a great well, suggestion but that's really it for me. I I had and I had brought this up to John earlier this week was you know I I don't have a lot of fear of the parents of really young kids coming out to support it cuz obviously they have a vested interest but I just wonder what our talking points are to those families that already have kids that are past center school age and that aren't going to be directly impacted. I mean Obviously, there is a selling point that it's it's a, for the betterment of the district. That overall is for the good of everyone in town in terms of your house values and things of that nature. I think I think now after seeing the presentation and hearing more about the community use of the building, that becomes another talking point. Um, but I just didn't know if there were any other points that you would want made for those people that are saying, "Well, I don't really care because it's my kids aren't going to go there." <laughs> This school, this, this building opened in 1957, and I came here in 1959, it was two years old. The school building ended at these posts. These were all classrooms and the library was across the hall. The, uh, I can remember my dad saying the same thing and when when to build the Elmwood School. All my kids are out of Elmwood School, why should I do that? My mother, at one of these, you know, it wasn't that rare, she usually corrected them quite a bit, but the supper table said, Shep! somebody supported your kids five years ago when they built the high school. Now it's your turn to support the other kids. So it's part of a community thing. And, you know, I, I try to make it kind of simple, but I remember that conversation distinctly. My kids are all gone out of college, and my last one just turned 40. And I'll support the schools because they know how important they are. Back <clears throat> probably 20 years ago, none of you were here, I don't think. I was. Um, there was the school... <laughs> district, the Hopkinton district was in, in dire straits. Um, they had, Holliston had started school choice. And I'm a townie, and, and I interviewed over in Holliston for two of my kids that go to the Holliston schools. Both of them were accepted. And Karen, my wife, said, no, we can't do this. We've got to keep them in town. And about that time, everything turned around. And now it, it, it was the beginning of the school system we have now. So. <clears throat> Not only did my kids get a good education, they all went to good schools, even the ones that I was going to send to Holliston. And, and the, the value of my house went four or five times what it was back then, other than just the economy, because everybody wanted to be here. And of course, we're kind of beat up by our own success because everybody wants to be here. The schools are, are, will get crowded. But the, the biggest thing is, I can say to an older jet like myself, is not only is the value of my property, you know, incredibly improved because of the school system primarily, uh, but it'll, it'll continue to improve because of the school system. The, the kids in this town are, are getting a private school education at a, at, a, at a public school place, and it's a deal of the century, and, and that's all I can say to people, people my age. All my kids are out. I'll, I'll pay the taxes, and, and, uh, and when I sell my house, I'll take the money and go somewhere, or give it to the kids. <laughs> I, I don't know what else you could say, but it, it, it's it's other than my my mother's famous speech to my father, "Shit, somebody took care of your kids. You got to take care of theirs." But the uh, the other thing is, the whole town is is rooted in the education system. I can't tell you how badly we were shape we were back 20 years ago, maybe a little bit longer, but uh, it's incredibly different now.
So the answer is, if you ask, get the question, have him call Mike. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so if you get the question, every, have him call Mike. Every road show. Because <laughs> I don't think anybody else can tell that story that well. <laughs> no, but it's a good point. I mean, that's a really good point. So. Yeah, it's it, it is it is what it is, and, and you know, and I I sit here in this room, and every time I come in here, I'm tickled because the, those were the classrooms. That was English, French, and I'm reading this thing. And I'm thinking how Mr. Rooney would be so proud of me. I could read the whole paragraph without making a mistake. But uh, my son Brennan and I made these columns, and, and because it wasn't in the budget for the middle school, the assembly of those shelves over there wasn't in the budget for the middle school. So Brennan and I that? came on weekends. That's what people do. We put this, we put them all together. We did this column, and uh, so you know I'm reminded every time I come here, and I think everybody in town, the old townies are the same way, and and the. Um, I think everybody realizes the importance of education, and, and uh, I, I don't think that will be a problem. If not, I'll make my speech a topic. <laughs> there we go. I think one of the things that Pam Waxlax on the ESBC made the point of is some people might think that we already voted for this because yeah. town meeting voted to purchase the land and a lot of discussion was around the fact that it was going to be for the school. Mm -hmm. So she, what she had heard from some people who got in touch with her was, why are you still talking about this? We already voted on it. You know, so that's a really strong message you need to get out, or everyone needs to get out is, no, <laughs> this is still we needed. Land. We have the land. That's all we have. So yeah. just making sure that maybe people who heard, you know, that in May we are already taking this up. Yeah. Need to be reminded it keeps going. To structure this whole thing so that nobody would get up at town meeting and say, as they always do, this is the first time I've heard about this. <laughs> That's the goal. So uh, I suspect somebody will do that, but I'm hoping that there will be enough other people in the audience who will say, just sit down. Right. You know, <laughs> we're terrified <laughs> to death. And, and, uh, but, you know, we're, we're realists. We know that could happen. And that's also what prompted this little series we're mm -hmm. doing in the next few weeks. Bringing just it back so to the forefront. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it isn't going to be just the, the moms and dads of the K pre-K first graders that are going to drive this thing. It's going to take way more than that. So, Jane, do you? I do. And I, I mean, I think Kelly makes a good point that, you know, you talked earlier about especially reaching out, like tonight's the Moms Club. A lot of the people who are most impacted or will be using the building and are newer to town don't really understand our unique uh, form of self-government here and so I do think that that's uh, that's uh, you know a strong piece of the um, the education campaign here um, so I did have a couple of first of all I wanted to say thank you because I don't know how many building committees you've been on but you definitely bring a level of security and credibility that is is badly needed and um, so I thank you particularly for your time and everybody I know a lot of time has gone into this and I think that you know in addition to what you said about you got to pay to educate children because other people paid to educate yours is absolutely right but I also do think that since the failure of the last project most of the community is on board understanding that something has to be done with that building and I don't think everybody was quite there yet and so in my mind this is the best value and very well reasoned and researched value um, to the community so it's not cheap but it's the best value and and we have to do something and so I think people are are on board with that I will say that I am getting a lot of questions about traffic in particular so I'm glad to see that on on this um, FAQ sheet and I I didn't hear before and I think I heard you say tonight about the traffic light yep. so that would probably be helpful light, uh, uh, crosswalks yeah and um, what was it the, the, the lanes, the, the lanes. Lane. So I, I knew about the lanes and the crosswalks, but I didn't know about the lights. So I think that would be a great thing to add to this FAQ sheet. And I did have a couple of other. We just got that recently. Yeah. No, so I have a couple other suggestions. It's probably just faster if I send them to John later yeah, and drag you all anyway, through, yeah. all through it. Except that I, my, my one comment just about the design and whatnot, and in talking about. Um, community use related to the gym. Mm -hmm. I know the center school is used for basketball, like youth basketball. So if there is the opportunity to do seating, um, I, th I think that's a little bit more embraced by older parents whose kids will be playing there on Saturday mornings and whatnot. So I don't know how big of a budget buster that is, but 
that would be a nice thing to, to squeeze in if we can. The, the it dimension was, issue it, too, right? It wasn't, it wasn't as much about the, the, the volume of the building is a big thing. The MSBA will reimburse up to a certain point. And they have all these standards. This is how big it can be. But the bleachers also take up a portion. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide whether you have a bigger play space or you have a small play space with bleachers. Mm -hmm. So we'll look into it. But the, um, the, the, it, you know, it, it looked like a space that the majority of the time was going to be teachers and kids and gym teachers and kids and nights, guys playing basketball and, and you know, those kind of leagues. Um, I, I'm not sure whether the intent, maybe we could look at it more and maybe some seating for, you know, um, high school uh, intramural type basketball and that kind of thing. Yeah, but I mean, I just... That's the other part of having the facility here is it becomes part of the bigger campus. Right. The proximity works out really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm, for off-site practices for the high school teams and whatnot, yeah, so... I think uh, it, to that to the point of the dimensions, it's, it's important to remember we talked about this being a unique project. In some cases, we we were very effective at getting the cl most we could out of the classroom space. Mm -hmm. So these classrooms, so if you look at the MSBA sort of elementary school gross square footage, it, it assumes smaller classrooms because it assumes a K-5 building. We need all larger classrooms in this, so we had to give a little to get a little in some places. And so that may be, it, we'll look into it certainly, but that may be what the restriction ends up being on the gym in terms of that space. The yeah. MSBA didn't have any standards for pre K and yeah. K-1. Right. It was all right. through violence. So it was all a kind of a learning curve for them as well. But we did pretty well in terms of the square footage that reimbursed. And uh, the, um, um, yeah, we also, we, we got extra points because it's going to be a LEED certified building. And, and uh, so energy costs will be kept to a minimum. Um, that was another thing you needed. Uh, we looked at the elevation. Oh, yeah. You might have noticed the solar panels on the elevation. I noticed all you folks probably have, you know, we have a little PTSD so, from that. Uh, these will be designed, not added to the roof, but they'll be part of the roof. They're not, these, they're, they're, they're in the budget now. Pardon? And they're not necessarily in yet. No. Right, we, yeah, we're still, we're still looking at, yeah. we're going to, yeah, uh, we yeah. can always take them out. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not the kind that are like on the high school roof. Okay. They, they're retrofitted. These are, uh, um, there, there aren't a lot of extravagances. We have to the planning board. Um, we were going to go with a more inexpensive veneer on the outside, more like the brick and more uh, block type, which a lot of schools do. Trying more defenses that should be brick, just like all the other schools. That's why you see red brick. Um, the architect attempted by taking different colors to make it more interesting. Mm -hmm. and, um, it'll, it'll, it'll be a good building, oh. and, and um, also, you know, given proximity to the park and since the town bought. Um, Waterfish Farms property. There's opportunity for a whole new trails network now that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. And get going by the school is just part of that. So that'll work out well as well. We have a whole another presentation about trails, but we didn't want to bore you. Uh, I think that would be great for our cross country teams. The other question that I do get a lot, a lot, is about the bus parking lot. Yeah. And I know that's not part of this plan, but if that's something that can how would that be able to be added into this project? Would that be a separate addition? Can I just, that's going to be in my chair report because we talked a little bit about that with the Board of Selectmen when we had a meeting, or with the with Ben Pelico. We met with him to discuss the roof, but but we did talk about how we would approach a bus parking lot. So I don't think it was part of the ESBC's plan, but I think that he talked about what they would be willing to approve and work with us on. Okay, well, I think... There's no question there's plenty of land. Right, exactly. Yeah. The question is, who's going to pay for it? Right. And, and, uh, but, yeah. and I suspect that will be part of the selectmen's thing when they look at the alternatives for the to the arrow site and the balance of this site as well. So I guess my final request would be if you could add a slide that tells the other additional forums that people can attend or if they have a question, how do they submit it? Um, I mean, I'm sure it's all on the website, but just to make it easier for people um, and coffees and then I just I'm gonna finally say that I know this you know now we're in the home stretch and I'll start throwing in all my sports metaphors but I know this is like the full court press but you got a whole bench over here yeah. so you know you should put us to work um, this is a different model than than what I've experienced before and I think you guys have done a tremendous job but we should absolutely 
carry our, our weight here. No, I think you're absolutely right. And, and uh, how, how, we, you know, how we can get questions to us is an important and, and you sound like somebody that's just gone through this. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any more questions or comments for Mike? All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you All very right, much. Thank you. thank you for your help and your support. And, uh, We'll, we'll muddle through and this will be a good time. Yeah. And everybody will have sync. That's very <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. So since we're um, behind schedule and we have Mr. Keller here, is anyone opposed to moving 6A, so it will business A, the middle school Washington, D.C. trip to next? No. Nope. Okay. Mr. Keller? I'm on down. Can you get him on time? What? <laughs> You are exactly on time at 8.10. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's fine. Okay. okay, so we are considering the request and recommendation of the superintendent to approve the revised DC venue based on parent feedback relative to the increased cost. And so the recommended motion is to move to approve the Washington DC trip. And as I think we can all remember, we did the intent to travel on this trip, but we haven't done um, a final approval of the trip. So I don't know if we've got questions on the motion, um, changes to the motion, or if someone would like to make the motion. I'll make the motion. I move to vote to approve the Washington DC trip. And now we'll open it up for any discussion. Second it. Well, John has to second it, and then we can discuss it. <laughs> No, I thought we were going to, we're opening up for discussion so that it doesn't get seconded so that we don't have to withdraw or something. Yeah. I, I, I got it. It's the motion's on the table, but it's not seconded yet because the motion might change. So the motion's on the table for discussion, and then when Take you're ready your to second. vote, then, then we ask for a second, at least is how we've understood it should be. And I think that's not what we did last time. I no. think we decided, do we, do we like the motion as written or do we want to have discussion okay. first? Yeah. And then... Discussion yeah. on the motion. Because, yeah. So, and I would also say, since he's here to give us a, pro he, we should hear from him first, probably, and then we. So I think that's the part we're trying to avoid. So he yeah. gives a presentation in the packet, and so he's here to answer questions. I guess if we have questions on what he provided, but we were trying to sort of eliminate the need for them to represent what they provided us. So. Okay, so I guess then, if nobody has any questions for him, they can go ahead and make a motion. Or if they do, then they would say that they wanted to. Ask your questions first. Okay, so we'll start again. Thank you for making the motion, John. <laughs> we're going to pretend that didn't happen, and we'll with withdraw your motion. Thank and you, Ms. We'll Laurie. Motion. Okay, Lori, <laughs> can you withdraw that? I withdraw my motion, and I do have a question. Okay, that great. Way. So, <laughs> if there's any questions for Mr. Keller or any discussion on the motion, let's. I, so, <laughs> can he? Could he has? Can he make an opening statement? <laughs> Mr. Sure. Mr. Keller. Um, Thank you for being here tonight, and I know that um, you know you've put a lot of work into improving this experience for kids. So I know you wanted to make an opening statement, um, and then I know the school committee is eager to ask you questions. Very confusing. Um, yeah. So thank you. I, I um, so as, as you know, I was here August fifth uh, with the intent to travel, which was a change to what was uh, requested uh, in the in the, uh, in the spring for the Washington D.C. trip, and this is based on. Uh, having attended the Washington DC trip and uh, feedback from staff and then observing uh, a different organization in Washington DC and, and ultimately so I'm, I'm making two recommendations as I did in the intent to travel uh, to change organizations to close up which I feel offers us a much greater educational uh, opportunity for our students uh, they will work with our staff to create interdisciplinary connections um, for our students and for our staff um, and to also move the trip to a flight uh, as well, which, um, which reduces the, the, the trip by one day. And both of those things uh, ultimately come with a, a price increase, which, uh, as, as you will certainly recall, um, on August 5th when I was here, um, the request was to get to gather more feedback from, from parents. And so I sent them a survey, and those, that was attached to the materials which I sent to you. So. I believe that's my opening statement. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only have one question, and I, I know I, I think we I sent it ahead of time, so I'm hoping I, you got it. Was I, We saw that 183 parents responded 
Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what percentage of the parent population is that, um, and that do you feel like too. you got a good response? Yeah, so I do feel, um, so 183, I, I think that's the most uh, respondents we've ever gotten to a survey. Uh, we have uh, 382 uh, parent emails on, uh, on our school wires listserv account. So uh, in receiving 183, I was, I was extremely pleased uh, with, with that return rate. That was the same question I had, so. Sorry. Two for one. Didn't know. <laughs> That's great. Now we're done. Anyone uh, else? I don't have any questions. I, the information was very thorough and exactly what we asked for. I don't have any questions. Okay, so would someone like to make a motion to approve the Washington, D.C. trip as presented in the agenda materials? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion by Ms. Nickerson, second by Mr. Graziano. All those in favor? Yes. yes. It's unanimous and so carries. Thank, Thank you. Mr. Thank, you Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Don't forget you unlocked that for us. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Alan. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, so now. Thank you for taking that out of order. Still don't have a student council representative. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we can move on to the ESBC, uh, Mr. Graziano, the communication plan. Yeah. So I don't. Um, we ended up talking about a lot of this, um, but as what we had presented here tonight. Um, so members of the elementary school building committee have been working on the, the communication plan, especially since we were zeroing in on a final date for town meeting um, and the ballot. So recognizing that those are the critical dates that we needed to communicate. Um, so the committee as a whole has gotten together and put together that presentation, which you just saw. Um, that presentation will be presented to, as we said, many organizations within town will be part of a public forum. Um, we currently have, I believe, 18 organizations scheduled um, to have meetings between now and town meeting, and we are adding them almost daily. Um, we have office hours scheduled at Waterfresh Farm um, in and around the public forum. There will be one that will be on a morning, and I don't know what happened to the, I opened the, ah, oh, there it is. Sorry. Google Docs, not a strength. Um, digital literacy. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, so, and I've, they're not here, the Waterfresh Farms one. So, oh wait, there we go, there we go. So on October 21st, they will be, there will be Water Fresh Farms office hours in the evening for the dinner rush from 4.30 to 6.30. And then on October 5th, they will be there in lunchtime from 11 to 1. Um, so we'll have multiple office hours there at, at Water Fresh Farm. Um, we're also, in addition, we're, we're using all forms of media that we can, um, that we can come up with. We have uh, the Facebook page is active. Hopefully everyone who is a Facebook user is a follower of the project. Um, please not only like the posts, but share the posts um, to your timeline. It's a great way to get information out. If you haven't done this in a while, go through and invite friends of yours that are from Hopkinton to like the page so they'll also get the updates. Um, we are working with um, local media, so we're providing some letters to the editor for the Hopkins Independent, um, as well as HCAM and others that will be posted in support of the project. Um, I know that a reporter from the Hopkins Independent is working on an article for the next issue of the Independent that will provide a lot more information about the project as well. Um, and then as Mike mentioned, I guess tomorrow they'll be taping this, but they're going to do that presentation on HCAM. It will be recorded, it will be posted online, and it will be run frequently. He said weekly. I'm pretty sure it's going to be more than weekly um, on HCAM. So really anybody who wants to have access to the information will be able to go get it in some form. Um, in addition, we are open to any and all ideas. Um, we've provided the school committee with the talking points um, as well as the FAQs or fast facts that we came up with. Um, appreciate the suggestions on things that we can add to them to make them better. And the biggest thing is just filter back to us um, questions that you're getting in the community so that we can make sure we're getting consistent messages out there. Um, so. John, quick question. These FAQ sheets, these, mm -hmm. sorry, I, I've read them a few times, but um, 
Right, can we get them anywhere? Like, I'm so, thinking about the fact that, like, I have a speak liaison meeting coming mm -hmm. up, and I can give them to people there. Like, where can we? So, absolutely. So, um, they're not, there's not an electronic version accessible yet because they were still in process and were finished around 3.30 this afternoon. Um, so, once, so I'd expect that tomorrow um, we'll be getting an electronic copy out there to everybody. Um, I, I don't know if we want to look into having sort of like a queue of printed copies, mm -hmm. maybe at like well, central I'll office that we could have. And I'm bringing them to any road show yeah. I'm going to. Oh, we'll to, definitely have them at the road speak. shows. I'll oh, that's right, we have them at yep. the next yep. one. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'll be bringing them handouts. So, but distributing them more widely than that, um, I think. Something we could have Talked like in Janine's office, maybe having a stack of them if people want to come in and grab them sure. if they're going to a meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. I mean, even if there's an electronic version of it that I can get my hands on. That's yeah. So electronic versions will be available. I, I don't have I don't have that one handy, but I'll send it out. The presentation is actually too large to attach, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. because of all the images. So it's going to be posted out to the Google Drive, and I'll share it with everybody um, on the make sure it gets shared with everybody so that you can access that as well. So my suggestion on the presentation is that people just once HCAM has it up there, take that link. And you can post that on your Facebook page. It can be posted yep. on the website. It can be yep. emailed to, to your friends and family. Um, I have many suggestions for additions to this. So if you could, I, I'll be happy to send them to you tonight. But if you could consider those before you start distributing mm -hmm. tomorrow, yep. um, I think there's some some key information that could could be could strengthen it. I mean, I think it's a, it's a great start, but there's just a couple of pieces that I think need to be added. But I um, and I think. You know, somewhere it needs to be readily accessible where all these forums are that people are able to go to if they're not in, if they're not a member of one of the groups that you've reached out to. Um, and I guess, you know, again, I'll just say I feel like all of us need to be participating and helping in that. So if there's a schedule and people are supposed to be signing up, I, I think we need to do that. Okay, I can make this the, I, I can make, I don't know if, I'll talk to Rob, I don't know if we have plans to do a master schedule of the committees, but that, or the uh, committee, the presentations, but that's a good idea, um, because I know the moms group only posted sort of yesterday and today, but this can give people more of a long view so that they have an opportunity, um, so, but we'll work on that. Well, the moms group one, and they, they actually had advertised that for a few weeks. Yes, the moms group did, but yeah. then it got opened up to the public, and I think we just yeah oh, we just I hit see. that. In that was just yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. We're also looking for opportunities, by the way. I should note to sort of go to people where they are, not just the water fresh farms, um, but we talked to um, some folks at Hopkins Youth Soccer. So um, we're going to be setting up some tables uh, in some of the central locations on Saturdays where people are playing soccer, um, so that we'll have poster boards and information um, for people who, you know. Just again, may not be going to a presentation, but might. But we know that hundreds and hundreds and of people come through those fruit street fields every Saturday. So, is the farmers market still happening? Mm -hmm. You would have to get permission from Parks, Parks and Rec. We can ask. Taking a note. And just important to to make sure we're cognizant of the uh, Office for Campaign Finance rules about you can have things available but you can't, uh, about h how you spend public money on this, basically. So just. So, uh, yeah, so we're, we're, so all, we're all squared away there. We've, we've been, we've done all the research, work with the attorneys, all this campaign pillars of finance. Okay. Yeah. So, because we good. can pay for these, but we can't necessarily, there are restrictions on the distribution. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're okay. So maybe, Further to what to Jean's point about us being available or being a bench, I, I, I'm not sure what <laughs> what analogy she used. Is there some expectation of us as school committee members, or is there something that we're supposed to proactively be doing? How are we supposed to be participating, if at all, in this process? So, so we we intentionally for the the road shows we intentionally targeted it at having a a project member and then an an education member, which is 90 plus percent of the time going to be Dr. McLeod. Um, because the focus is obviously on the educational plan and then the project process that we've gone through. So in terms of presenting at the road shows, um, there isn't necessarily an expectation. Um, if you want to be present for them, again, we'll share the schedule. I think it's, a, it's always a good thing to, to be able to be there and, and answer any questions. And then I, I think the other piece is just being ready with the information so that if people have questions, um, 
for you that, that you're prepared to answer them. And if you don't have information that you think you need, let us know. Um, but again, we're open to any and all ideas. So if there's something that you think we'd like, you'd like to be doing as school committee members, let me know. Or Rob or Joe or Mike or anyone. Anyway. The other group you might want to chat with that I just thought of that's right before town meeting is um, Hoptoberfest. <laughs> is the Friday before. Um, so you might want to talk to the library group. Want it. Um, because that is a good audience there. Um, I mean, I I personally think, I mean, for us, we just really, like when we're at the soccer fields or lacrosse practices or all the different things that our kids are involved in, just talking to everybody that we can about it. and. You know, I know for a fact that we've been like making sure that people have liked the page on Facebook and showing them where to find it. Mm -hmm. So, I think I think those are like the most key personal things we can do mm -hmm. as members. But um, and making sure that what Kelly said is is you know that people do understand that it's not a done deal. Right. I can yeah. see that people would think that. I I, I can. Mm -hmm. well, we yeah. do then need the information sort of Jean's talking about a little bit because if you got it if we're going to like redirect or sort of filter them to the, the bigger information we got to know when they are right like when they are and where they are yep, we sort I'll share, of need yep, that, I'll share that that master yep. calendar well I keep saying the reason I'll say I'll share that because I actually won't Rob will okay <laughs> we'll share it yes but I just think I mean if yep. if the intent if our if our best participation is to filter and to redirect it which I'm I'm happy to do I think I need to know where and when to be redirecting them. I mean, I can I have think them all your send best you, you an email. <laughs> the best participation is to answer questions people have. And if their questions are, I really just don't know enough about the project, then it's potentially to redirect them to that. But that's sure. why you guys have the, the full presentation with the talking points and the, the FAQs, or we're calling them fast facts now. Um, that, you know, that, that's, I think, the best, that, the best participation. Okay. Do we want to move on to, is everyone ready to move on to liaison reports? Does anyone have a liaison report? I do. Great. <laughs> <laughs> You're really behind schedule, so if you can <laughs> go for it. Um, so we, the, the speak group, which we've all referred to as speak for years, is now renaming themselves CPAC because in yes. every other town in the state they are called CPAC. And apparently I found out that the only reason why they were called speak is because someone flipped the letters when flipped they did the, e. the when they did the uh, application and it stuck, which I actually kind of like the name, but it doesn't work with the rest with of the, the state. acronym, no. Um, which is funny for um, Karen also because she's so used to calling it CPAC that it's been very easy for her to flip from speak to CPAC. So their first meeting was very well attended, I'd say probably. 20 to 25 people, which to me is astonishing because my first meeting I went to last year at this time, there was four and three of them were board members. So um, they've really been very successful in recruiting new members um, and a lot of the parents that are now coming have young students, some as young as preschoolers that are impacted by special education needs. Um, so they have a wide breadth of experiences going on within the district, which is great because you're hearing about their experiences from pre-K all the way up through the high school. Um, I think purposely so, Karen had a large part in this meeting in talking about what she's seen in her first 90 days on the job and what her plans are for the coming year. Um, so I think that the group overall was very receptive to her and appreciative of all the work that she's done this far to get any kind of impact statements from parents. Um, the one area that the group really is focused on is how to drive parents that may not know about the special education link on the listserv to get there and click it so that they're getting special education notices from the district. Um, so there was a lot of discussion about how to do that um, and both some concerns on privacy and also in how to really get at these parents so everyone is really as knowledgeable as they can be. And then um, Karen talking about her new website and we were trying to drive people there and I, I saw in the Elmwood um, principal's report that 
he had her new message as a link on there. So I think the principals are really helping her in that, um, trying to get her messages out to families in other ways. So overall, the meeting was really great. It was a full two hours. It was very well attended, and I, I expect that they're going to continue. And I think also because their fundraising efforts have been so successful in the last couple of years, because they actually sell their marathon bid numbers to the highest bidder, that they are looking at some unique programs that they might work with the schools to bring in other opportunities for enrichment for special education students in the middle school and high school. So, so that was... Was that brief enough for you? It's great. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, for the school committee chair report, um, first I'll quickly, I sort of touched on it in responding to something Jean had asked um, Mr. Shepard. But we, we met with uh, the town manager and the chair of the board selected on September 15th to talk about the roof and where... Um, town council was in pursuing a claim and or investigating reimbursement or any liability issues. Um, where they are is town council has uh, had discussions with the insurance company. It's, it's um, I think as we reported at the, at the town meeting that the insurance company is not willing to cover. They don't believe that it's in their policy to cover the damage done by um, the solar company. And then the question becomes, so the solar company is a tenant, and so as an active tenant, do we have a cause of action against them as a tenant? Um, one of the things that, t the next step that the town manager wants, wanted to take before any demand letter is to basically go to um, solar energy advantage and say, you know, when we get the roof repaired, all the stuff is coming off. And so we're not allowing you to put it back on, you know, unless you give us some reimbursement or some relief from the damage that you caused. And so it's going to be maybe a, I don't know, cordial conversation at first, and we don't know where that will end up. But as far as insurance claims, it's, um, I think everyone feels pretty clear, and the council, town council looked at it and says it's not covered. Um, the next thing we talked about was just really briefly the budget um, cycle and how we felt about the budget process last year and not really feeling like we knew what the number was until well after we had gone through our process. Um, they seemed to feel that we went through our process and then sort of w went to them like after the fact, like, well, now here we are, so you have to give this to us. So the, the proposed approach this year is to go to them in... October, um, in and around the time we get the budget message, I think, mm -hmm. and sort of tell them these are our major budget drivers, and they want that to include the capital improvement warrants that, that we're intending to bring up. So they feel that we, they shouldn't be met with a bunch of surprises at, at the end of the day or right before town meeting, and for some reason they think that that's how they've received our reports, apparently, in the past. Um, without sort of saying, yep, that's, that's what happened or that's not what happened. We just agreed that, okay, we'll come to you in October with our big picture, um, our projections, and tell you what we think really matter and what the drivers are. And so we have a meeting scheduled for, is it October 15th? It's around that time, yep. Um, and so we'll have that meeting at that time. The other thing they, they brought up in this sort of budget conversation and, and drivers was, bang for the buck, and so I don't know if it was Dr. McLeod, but we immediately we started talking about bus parking and how that could impact um, bus contract negotiations and how we should really start to think about it now before we re-enter um, bus contract negotiations, because that might open it up to new bidders, might save us money, not just on having parking and the tax implications, but it could save us money with respect to getting more bids for busing. Um, so. The, the, the message from the Board of Selectmen was that they would entertain uh, using some of the land that the town has now acquired for a bus parking lot. And, you know, it was a very quick conversation. So we didn't go through who would pay for it, who would maintain it, what the security would be. Um, but I think he certainly felt that it was doable and something that they would approve if we um, talked about it and came up with a plan. So... Um, 
that's something that, you know, Dr. McLeod will look at further and talk to Ralph about, and we'll talk about what that could do for us if we could get parking and what it would look like. Um, I think that's it for, for my report on that meeting. Um, the only other thing I wanted to talk about, and I talked with Kathy about this earlier today, and actually at some point last week, is communications and how they come into the school committee and when and if at all we address them publicly. So if there's a, someone comes in for public comment and they've, they obviously approach the whole committee and everybody hears their question and our answers. If someone writes to us a letter, it might come to one, per, or gives a phone call, it might come to one person and at what point does the rest of the committee know about it and or respond. And so, I mean, my practice will be to share with the committee the communication. Um, I, don't, I would hope that ends up being everyone's practice to at least share it with the superintendent. And then if it's something big enough or widespread enough, she would share it with the rest of the committee so that we all know what people are talking about, what people are saying, and how we should respond. With respect to talking about some of the stuff publicly, if it's a big enough issue or something that we've already been considering, it'll probably be part of the chair's report. And that's um, at sort of specific to the letter that I circulated today, which we got from an anonymous community member. This was already something the superintendent was looking at, and so it was part of her report for tonight anyway, and so that's how that will be responded to. Um, but I think we'll sort of take it as it comes, but I think it's um, nice, and it would be great if everyone would make sure that communications or questions get to either get redirected to a principal or a teacher or the superintendent, but at least from our perspective, we also say, this is what we heard, we told them to go to the teacher, and so then she can follow up with the teacher or if, if it's necessary. So I think that's it. So now we can move on to the superintendent's report. Sir, I have a question. Yep. Uh, on your first part, mm. um, you mentioned on the bus parking lot. Yes. Um, related to that land, I noticed on the Board of Selectmen actions, they talked about forming a master plan committee for that space of land, the, I guess, remaining Irvine and Todaro properties. Mm -hmm. uh, is the expectation that we'll have involvement in that master plan committee? Because I just saw that they were seeking community volunteers. I, I was at the Board of Selectmen meeting. I don't know if you've had follow-up or I can give the update. No, you can give the, go ahead, give the update. So I was at the Board of Selectmen meeting, and um, although one of the members advocated for removing the school committee liaison, from that committee, I think ultimately they decided that it was important because the school is on that property and, you know, there's room enough for other future buildings if that's what's needed or whatever. So I, as a, my understanding as of Tuesday night is that there is still a school committee representative expected to be invited to that committee. Okay. I think that's important. I think it's critical. Yes, I agree. Are there any other questions about all the stuff I had to say. <laughs> I, I do have a question, and maybe you're going to cover this, Kathy, when you talk about the budget cycle. But um, so, based on what you said, it kind of sounds like at our next meeting we have to vote our capital. Well, we already have our priorities, right? I mean, so so we can take a look. Don't don't we have them prioritized and numbered from from? It's a ten-year plan. It's so. a, right. Yeah. So we usually review it every year, but not necessarily by our first October meeting. I, I don't know. That was that's a, a giant speed up to me. And I think I, I, I think Kathy and I thought it was doable. So. Didn't, didn't we think that we would be able to at least talk to them with respect to what would be the drivers and what they, the example given was the security article and I'm, let's not talk about whether or not that's a, that's a valid issue right. but the, that was the example and they want if that's going to be if, if there's going to be something that's a big driver and we're going to put forward as a capital article um, warrant then we should they should know that it's coming. Even though it's a joint article. It, well, that's why, I, let's like, let's not talk about the specific example. <laughs> let's just say that's their, that's what they would Couldn't like. Resist. And that's what we said we'll endeavor to do. Yes, they were surprised about the joint article, which we talked about. But I think I wanted to add, Alan, to your yes. comment and to answer Jean's question. We were not only talking about capital. 
they wanted to know, do you have a sense by the middle of October what your strategic initiatives are going to be? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that I know what those are right now based on our strategic plan, based on the update that I gave you in the pamphlet format, mm -hmm. and I highlighted these are going to have budget implications. So we know, and I've followed up with the admin team in terms of their budget planning, where the priority initiatives are going to be that are going to have budget impact. And I think it's at that level that initially uh, the expectation is that we'll have a conversation in addition to working with Ralph and Al on taking updating. There's been a lot of conversation between the three of us on um, a preventative maintenance plan and what that's going to mean. So we're, we have pretty, we're certainly not there, and we've only begun the conversations, but we have some pretty clear direction on where we need to go. So can I ask one question? Because if we're being asked to provide this information earlier, and I guess I'm not understanding the comment of receiving things on the eve of town meeting when we finish our budget process in January, but neither here nor there. Our budget process has always been a bit difficult because of the fact that we don't have any guidance from the town prior to us starting our budget review in November, December of last year. So based on your working to give them the information they want, the timeline they want, are we going to have any additional information to assist us in our budget discussions come December? That's so, go ahead. I think that the understanding is yes. Mm -hmm. yes. They're, they're they are going to have a much better timeline with us as well. And we're, it's going to be an ongoing, I think, monthly meeting with them. Um, to, to get this sort of schedule, to have a conversation about what's happening. I, so it's really difficult, and I guess to Jean's point of like actually saying this is definitely going to be the one, the capital warrant article, or this is how much we're anticipating with respect to our 10-year plan. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we agreed to have it at that level of detail. And I also don't want to miss her. He didn't say, you know, at the eve of town meeting. But there was just this feeling that we come up with a budget and then we, we push it on the Board of Selectmen. And so they would like to be apprised of what we're going to push <laughs> later, or, or sooner rather than later. Right. And so with re if we can segue into my report, because it is, it is I'll, I'll stick with this piece, the recommended budget cycle. In your packet was the recommended budget cycle that that I've worked with Ralph and the admin team to develop. Um, and alongside it, uh, I've, I've given you what is, I had this conversation or this feedback from Norman today, just today, that this is still in draft format. Uh, when I asked Janine to call over to Jamie to say, hey, I still don't see anything about the joint Board of Selectmen school committee meeting listed on here. And I know from the date, September the 18th, that this went out before the meeting that you were at on Tuesday night, where yes. it did come up that right. there that needed to be added to this. So I asked Janine to call over tonight um, to say, hey, where is it? And he said, well, they're aware of it, they've made note of it, but they haven't come up with an exact date yet. Um, but of concern, and along that line, there were a couple of things on this that, that concerned me that I'll bring to your attention. The first is um, on our list, recommended budget cycle. I have written February 1st is the deadline to submit the budget to the town manager, and they've listed January 29th. Mm -hmm. I, I don't have a calendar in front of me. I don't know if there's a weekend I in between. I checked that. I think that's a Friday. The 29th, the 29th is the Friday? Exactly. Okay. Okay, so then I can make that change on ours. So the first is a Sunday. Um, the oh, February first is Monday. a Monday. Yeah, it's February 1st. First is a Monday. So. The February 1st is the Monday, so which is correct? February 1st is correct. February 1st well, is correct. Well, that's what it says in the charter. Yeah. So January the 29th is not correct. Cor correct, that correct. That was a request, so, but yes. February 1st is, a, is the charter deadline. Is the charter deadline. Okay. Um, then I have concerns about the, um, and this is what we voiced, Ellen and I, in our meeting, to the way in which we have done things as far as we go through our entire very thorough budget process between now and the end of December. It seems that when we get to CIC and the Board of Selectmen, they haven't been well apprised of the details of what we're asking, and yet your job is to approve the school committees, the school department's budget. So it very much feels, and I have voices to the, to the town manager, that we're spinning our wheels because we've already gone through this conversation and then we go through it again, and we're speaking to people who don't have the 
the benefit of the detail of the amount of work um, and, and your, your lens of how you've already asked all of these questions. So I asked the town manager, would it be possible, and we've discussed, to have representation come to our meetings in the month of um, these meetings that are listed in December. If we had liaisons from the Board of Selectmen, uh, Mr. Mosier and Mr. Herr are our liaisons, and then a representation from the Appropriations Committee, not, not suggesting that we change their calendar, but at least when we did come to their meetings in March, it wouldn't be a surprise to them. It wouldn't be news to them that these are things, they would hear the conversation and the level of detail that the school committee goes through before they approve the budget. So that is something that, that I put out there that the answer was, um, and, and, and actually uh, Mr. Kamala also responded to my request that, that said, could we have time slots on those meetings instead of having all the department heads come and sit for five hours? And he said yes, that there will be time slots for different departments to come, that those dates are likely March the 8th and March the 9th. Um, so those are things that are, you know, when you compare these two things side by side, come to, come to light. So historically, we've, we've always invited the liaisons from the Board of Selectmen to come to our budget meetings and in addition sent them the budget books, which I assume we're still doing. If not, we should do it. So um, I, I certainly understand from their perspective that it's challenging to be surprised, but I do think that we've had a system in place that should prevent that and so maybe if we can all rededicate ourselves to, to that on both sides of the town. <laughs> that would be great. Um, yeah, I guess I was under the impression that the, all those parties were invited last year and they didn't attend. And so I guess that was my question as to you can feed them water, but you can't make them drink. Mm -hmm. Okay. What will be nice about this process is sort of it's a, it's a rededication, I guess, because now we can go talk to them once a month and say, this is the material got. Do you have any questions? Right? I mean, what... It, it seems like we're going to be you know, going to another meeting and, and having another step, but I think that Kathy and I are both willing to do it, and it seems um, that uh, the town manager and uh, chair of the board of selectmen is willing to do it. So that might be the extent of those meetings, is basically here's the information that we mm -hmm. provided, and this is the summary of what we discussed at our meeting. Do you have any questions in that type of... Um, engagement so that when we do get to February mm -hmm. 1 in those meetings in March they'll have had ample opportunity to, to sit and talk with us. Very quick update. Um, you Wait, had a, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so I just have to say I, 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 what makes me hopeful is the weekly meetings. As monthly. Monthly <laughs> meetings, whatever. Dr. <laughs> McLeod, as Dr. McLeod knows well, we've tried. I will say I've been through this budget process five times now. And the consistent, consistent theme, and I'm saying it on television, is we don't get the information from Town Hall. We bring it to them earlier, we moved our budget cycle up. We do not get the information from Town Hall. I am hopeful that your meetings will, will provide that, but I'm putting it out there. That's the gap, and it has always been the gap. I think in that in that regard too, um, uh, we haven't. Unless have we heard back about the charter review committee? Because that needs to. So this is all really relevant to that conversation, which you know we we should be having this year. And <coughs> and I think that you know all of this is really important feedback to include in that. Mm -hmm. um, so the conversation about the charter review, that was also, I think, I mean, I was, I was trying to run out to a meeting, and that was brief, but it was uh, the intention of the Board of Selectmen is to have a meeting with the chairs of each board to talk to them about the liaison role, and he understands that we already have voted on our liaison role, um, but he still it, intends to go through this process where he meets with, so me from the school committee and the other chairs to talk about who and what the intention of the committee is for the charter review, and then have us put forward our liaison member. And so he said that he understands we already did it, but he, this is still the process that he thinks 
So, so the process is outlined in the charter. <laughs> so hopefully that will be a smooth conversation. <laughs> so um, I, it, did, it came up. It was very brief. And I'm not sure. Is there a timeline for him, for, for the committee to be appointed? Well, it has to be voted on in May. So The charter. Yes, that, that came up, too. Because mm -hmm. so, you know, any day now would be good. I, I think it's voted by the town in May at the mm -hmm. town meeting. The new yeah. charter. Yeah. Yep. So I did, I did think it was a longer process because I did not. So I said, you know, something about the school committee liaison. And, and in, in any event, he said, oh, no, no, the charter will be done. The new charter will be done in May. And I was like, that's going to be very quick. So he knows the timeline. Um, and I, I think the next time we're going to hear from him is he's going to convene this meeting um, with the chairs to talk about who should be on the committee. Right? Is that your understanding? Mm -hmm. That's okay. what it sounded like. Ready? Yes, new building. Um, you asked, you oh, asked me to give you some it. feedback on absences up, uh, over Rosh Hashanah. Oh, we had 74 student absences. And we had nine teacher absences, uh, teachers TA, one TA, so eight teachers, one teacher assistant. Um, center school, 11 students, so the breakdown, eight students from the Elmwood School, 10 from Hopkins, 26 from the middle school, and 19 from the high school. So that's a significant number of students affected. Mm -hmm. um, then the other uh, part of my report I wanted, you know, it kind of goes along with the opening of school. Um, but as you know, we had a change to the bus routine, the bus schedules between the Elmwood School and the Center School. Um, perfect storm this year because, as you also know, we changed the parent pickup procedures. So we've had some really positive things that have come out of the changes. We also, at the same time, moved the preschool. So although there was clearly a lot of planning that went on in preparing for the opening and the root routes, there's always things that have to take place at the beginning of a school year. Um, when I say perfect storm, we were then uh, notified at the last, very last minute that there was going to be some significant construction taking place on Main Street mm -hmm. that we couldn't, didn't know about and couldn't possibly plan around. So that is impacting um, dismissal um, and sometimes arrival. Um, we have worked over the past two weeks with across departments to work with the Elmwood School to address the concerns at both arrival and dismissal. I had significant safety concerns at my first, the first time I went over there. Um, and I've been working on both ends because clearly what's happening at Center affects what's happening at Elmwood. Mr. Dumas has been over multiple times. Mrs. Fitzpatrick has been there. Mr. Powers has been there. The administration has been there. We are very much aware and very concerned um, about the procedures. And that's why together, as an administrative team, we've spent literally hours over there um, tweaking and changing and trying to come up with a solution that works both timely, in a timely fashion, and most importantly, um, looking at the safety of the students. On the plus side, the parents, the Elmwood parent pickup are thrilled. Um, it's quick, it's smooth, it's, it's now uh, solved the problem of the unsafe conditions on Wood Street because parents no longer have to line up and be, you know, there wasn't anywhere, there was no shoulder. So that was solved. Um, there's been an additional lanes that have been put in place. Um, by the end of this week, Mr. Dumas, I believe we have solved the preschool um, drop off and pick up because they were we thought there was enough of a window because there's a half an hour window, but because parents are coming as early as they are to drop off now around the back of the building, preschool parents couldn't get to where they needed to be, um, and we had to provide another access point for them. So I just want to make you aware that there have certainly, and I know this is what Ellen was re referencing in terms of the concerns that were brought to your attention around what was labeled as a chaotic um, arrival and dismissal um, procedures. I would, I would not disagree with that word, um, which is why it was brought to my attention to begin with and which is why I ended up over there because clearly the superintendent is not typically involved in arranging dismissal procedures. Um, but this was significant enough that I've been over there multiple times um, and also to the center school. So we're working on it. We continue to work on it. Every day gets a little bit better um, to the point where 
I met with the center school principal um, today to ask her to share what they're doing over there that, that could be helpful um, for us to improve how we're doing things at the Elmwood School um, because teachers are being asked to stay longer than they should have to be asked to stay. And that is something that we clearly want to address. Um, and I believe that I've got some good suggestions for how that might be addressed. Um, but all of that to say, um, again, there have been a lot of eyes on this and um, we're doing what we can. And we will not stop looking at it until we have a solution that works. I want to add to that, Mr. Dumas, you have been over there. Yeah, um, we were hopeful that uh, today would have been a good day for us to uh, determine whether the preschool drop-off uh, was going to work the way we wanted it to. Uh, a couple of things happened. Um, uh, the construction on Wood Street um, has really Mock things up, <laughs> uh, so parents weren't uh, were not all arriving at the same time. So the preschool parents had a nice easy shot. So they were all happy today, because the Elmwood parents oh, weren't there. Okay. Uh, so it's going to take us a little while to really know, but uh, we feel pretty confident that uh, the steps that we've uh, taken. Um, sorry, you all out there who like burning bushes, but we had to pull a few out yeah. uh, to make the. Uh, um, lane a little bit wider so that we could get two lanes uh, mm -hmm. over where the uh, gymnasium is so uh, one so. of the things to add to that one of the things that we just thought logically was well you know the preschool parents can pick up at the back of the building too right because their their program starts a full half hour before the other program but parents are coming at 10 after 8 for an 845 drop off they're not allowed kids are not allowed in the building from parent drop off till 845 for a nine o'clock beginning beginning of the day, they're lined up at eight ten, so it's great because there's room for them. But then it backs up to the point where it's backing up beyond the entry to the preschool parking lot. Okay. So there's no and there's no passing on the side of the building um, at the back towards the back. So it's not even as though the preschool parents could go around behind. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are constraints around which which makes sense that a preschool parent also might have a center school child. And so they're waiting for the bus for their center school child, but the drop-off at the preschool is, uh, is preventing them from then getting back to be at the bus stop with the for, this, for the center school, and then the traffic constraints on top of that. So I um, appreciate people's patience as we, as we work through this, um, but it certainly has been, I'd say, the only area, Mr. Dumas, yep. where we've had, we've had concerns around dismissal and, and arrival. Not even dis uh, dismissal, arrival in the morning. Yeah. The dismissal at the uh, Elmwood School uh, after we made some tweaks is really, really smooth and really, really safe. Yeah. And uh, the center school has always been that way. Uh, actually, we have center school now in the afternoon loading four buses at a time, whereas in the past they would only load three at a time. Well, now, you know, we had to have a conversation because we need to get the buses over to the uh, Elmwood School, so they made some adjustments to the way they're doing business. The YMCA staff mm. is uh, riding the bus from the center school to the Elmwood School, taking attendance um, before they get on the bus mm -hmm. at center, segregating uh, their children from the other bus 14 kids so that when they get to Elmwood, they can quickly get them off. They're physically separated, so the Y... Uh, staff member knows exactly who's supposed to come off and who's supposed to stay on. So that's really worked very, Entering very well. Entering a separate door. Entering a separate door. Yeah, they were yeah. kind of trying to go in while others were trying to come out, and you know, there there were lots of things. But it's it's working. The last time I saw the Y dismissal, it was like off the bus yep. and right in, and it was perfect. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, I think things are going much much better. Uh, clearly, in the afternoon, things are going very well. Okay. Um, so. Can I just ask, do you know how much longer the construction is supposed to be? It's off and on. The report that we got is the same one that people see as a public announcement. I mean, it, it's it's slated to be off and on for weeks. For, for weeks. And, and the big one is going to be uh, in a few weeks when they close down Fruit Street mm -hmm. uh, to do uh, work on culverts. Uh, and we don't know yet when that's going to be. Uh, and we're obviously we've begun uh, trying to figure out how we're going to reroute buses. Because uh, parents are going to have to transport their kids uh, to, you know, other bus stops 
uh, because our buses won't be able to ride on Fruit Street. I mean, I was on Wood Street tonight at 5:45, and they were still paving. So that whole area, and they're down to one lane with one traffic cop directing traffic. So, and they haven't even painted them yet. So I have to assume by November this will be done because after the frost hits, they can't do it anymore. I'd like to make a, a, though, a shout out to DPW and to yep. Mr. Westerling because when I reached out to him, the minute I heard about this and asked for them to come over and have a meeting with us, they were there the very next day, um, met with Mr. Dumas and Mrs. Fitzpatrick. And Mr. Westerling was there. Who yeah, else? Mr. Uh, Manzer? Mike Manzer was there, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck Wallace from mm -hmm. the police department, and Joe Bennett. In the police department, as long as there are police details out there, if they see school buses, mm -hmm. they'll wave that traffic through. So they're they're uh, being good soldiers. Uh, and they were also, when, when when possible, going to try to to work the you know start the work after um, nine o'clock mm -hmm. when they could. So they've been very cooperative in terms of you know we we understand that they have a job to do as well. Um, so we're working through it together. That's my report. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to new business. <laughs> Joint capital project with town in the amount of $285. For consideration is the payment of reimbursement for a joint capital project appropriated in reference to Article 23. Due to the joint nature of this appropriation, the town finance department processes payments using a request for payment, joint capital form. This requires three school committee signatures. Um, there's a recommended motion. Move to approve the payment of $285 to the vendors as indicated on the request for payment joint capital form. Is there any discussion or revision to the motion? Would anyone like to make the motion? So I'll move to approve the payment of $285 to the vendor as indicated in the request for payment joint capital form. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. yes. Unanimous and so carries. The next item is Capital Project School Department, Article Warrant Number 16-013 in the amount of $17,046.54. For consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to pay the invoice for a capital project as appropriated in Article 14. The recommended motion is to move to approve the payment of warrant number 16013 in the amount of $17,046.54 to the vendors as outlined in the warrant. Is there any comment or discussion on the motion on the recommended motion? someone like to make the recommended motion. I'll move to approve the payment of warrant number 16-013 in the amount of $17,046.54 to the vendors as outlined in the warrant. Second. Motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Nickerson. All those in favor? Yes. Yes, it's, yes unanimous and so carries. Next is a budget transfer request. This is a transfer of remaining funds in the extended school salaries budget into the extended school committee contracted services budget. The word committee was not supposed to be in there. Sorry, sorry. In, sorry. sorry. I was wondering what the it was supposed to be. Uh, 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 that was a correction made just before the meeting tonight that Mr. Dumas caught. Okay. Thank you. So the recommended motion is to move to approve the budget transfer in the amount $13,610 as indicated in the agenda materials with that revision. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Would someone like to make the recommended motion? I'll move to approve the budget transfer in the amount of $13,610 as indicated in the agenda materials. Take those. Is there a second? Second. Sorry. All those in favor? Yes. 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 It's unanimous and so carries and that was a motion by Mr. Graziano and a second by Ms. Nickerson. We've already covered old business A. Moving on to school committee policy IHBG, home education. It's up for its second reading. I believe, Dr. McLeod, are we? I'd like to make a statement if I may. Okay. But if you, do you want to make the recommended motion um, or do you want? Well, I thought for the discussion? home education yes. that we were talking about. Yes. May I make, yes. a, make, mm -hmm. a, make a comment? Um, so, um, 
for the benefit, obviously, of the school committee. Um, I wanted to take, to take responsibility for not getting the, there was, there was some misunderstandings and confusion, right, around getting the home education policy, IHBG, shared um, sufficiently with those who are, part who, ha who are home educating their students. I do have some information for you on that, but that's kind of related to our discussion. Um, and in so doing, I learned that we typically, on our, on our roster, although we have the information in folders, on our roster, our electronic roster, do not maintain electronic email contacts with the families um, because the communication that's taken place between the assistant superintendent's office and the families is always by mail. Um, in in yeah, addition, letters, Mr. Yeah. Burlow, you yep. said that there's been different forms over the years? Yeah, we've had uh, some families have been uh, homeschooling for a while, and uh, the form that was has been in play about maybe five years ago did not ask for email addresses. So for some of the people, we do not have email addresses. But we do communicate with everybody via written letters. So mm -hmm. that's the way it, it, it goes. So. so there was a glitch in communication um, within my office, and it did not get sent out until Tuesday. Because of that, and because, so letters did go to everybody that is, is on our list, um, of which we have 14 families. Um, that includes 25 students. So uh, obviously multiple students from different families. Um, those letters did go out on Tuesday. However, um, you know, I, I do feel that th that did not give sufficient time for families who may want to weigh in on this discussion to be able to do so. Um, my suggestion is that we have some discussion tonight, um, but that the motion um, be removed or amended, however, whatever language you want to use, so that we bring it back you know, on October the 8th. Mm -hmm. So you just don't make the motion. We right, just John? don't make the motion, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So is there any discussion on the policy um, w that was provided in the packet knowing that we will not be moving to adopt it today? I did. Ha I had a conversation with Dr. McLeod yesterday, or t I don't remember what day, it doesn't matter, um, about s a couple of things that I thought we might be able to incorporate. Um, first, at the particularly the high school level, where we do have tech or online VHS or tech online courses, not TECA, which is the full online school. We're not talking about that, but just um, individual courses where we have, if we have seats that are not filled by our students, um, if those can be made available to homeschool students, um, if that's a possibility, I think it would be nice to, to include that um, in here. I mean, obviously, space available. And then the other thing that we had talked I'm about. Sorry, Jean. Under yeah. the definition of extracurricular is what I think you were asking that we add, right? In, instead of making the definition as as strict as being before and after school, I think you were asking. Well, that I, I don't know that a, an online course would be an extracurricular mm. uh, thing, but the but the other part about about that is that there are often or occasionally enrichment programs that are brought into the school, for example, by the mm. t PTA or the HEF. Mm -hmm. um, and if those are opportunities that can be extended to our homeschool students, I think there's a lot of value to those programs. It provides you know, some enrichment, some socialization, um, and that seems like, I'm not the educator, but I would love it if, if that's something that could be opened up. I'd like to see that included in this as well. Okay. Are there any other comments? Um, so, Dr. McLeod, we we talked and we a bit about. I, I think we I mentioned field trips, dances, nature's classroom. Mm -hmm. um, I, that might have been it uh, for me with respect to how would those be handled, um, and then. You know, does this address it by you defining extracurricular as things that happen during the regular school day? Does that mean dances are possible but field trips and nature's classroom is not? Or is that something that we'll have to take up separately in a, in a different paragraph? Mm -hmm. um, and then 
the other thing we talked about, and I, I don't know if you want to speak to it today or, or not, if you've had, had time to sort of think about it, but is the idea that, you know, how did this work mm -hmm. in Easton and why do we think it won't work here mm -hmm. or what's been the feedback here? Um, and then for my part, I, I did, I tried to look into some things so we have had communications from the public. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there are, my understanding is after looking at a bunch of regulations across states, across the United States, there's certain states do allow and require that they have access to intracurricular. Mm -hmm. um, and Massachusetts is not one. And so Massachusetts is extracurricular only is required. And um, the towns that are offering, they're, they're doing that. It's, it's not a state requirement. And it's certainly not something that the state reimburses for. Or um, I, I guess it's just not, it's not a requirement in our state. And so I think that's why districts have make different decisions. And so I wanted you to maybe speak to the district that you've been in and the different decision and how you think that would or why okay. you think that would or wouldn't work in Hopkinton. Right. Um, so I was in a very different position, obviously, right? I was, I was the assistant superintendent. I wasn't the superintendent. I wasn't working with school committee on policy. Um, and I wasn't there when that policy was written. So I don't have a deep understanding of what the differences would be. It was more just a comment that I'm aware of the fact that different districts do things differently when it comes to this policy and it's not consistent. I mentioned Ashland. I got the information from, from some, a survey that went out to surrounding uh, superintendents. So I can't speak to the reasons why it was established as policy in the way in which it was in Easton any more than I can speak to how the, the reason it was established the way it was in Ashland. Um, I, I sit currently as the superintendent with a policy that was established by the school committee that I'm recommending we not change. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it was set that way by the school committee back in, I mean, 2007, um, and what may or may not have changed. I do believe that the biggest change in this district was that it wasn't being enforced mm -hmm. consistently. So I believe it was set for a reason as a guideline here. Um, and because I wasn't here when those decisions were made and neither were any of you, you know, we wouldn't know that. But when I did check, and we did talk with my administrative team, um, they, they felt that this policy as it stands provides the guideline, effective guidelines within which they would like to continue to work. I also said to Ellen, you know, it, for me it's similar to the, um, the attendance letters that we talked about as bringing up um, school attendance as policy and you said to me, I want you to take back, back, that back to the principals. I want you to talk with the principals about that before you bring it which I think is consistent with this policy because they're the ones that have to, they, they have to monitor it and, and implement it. I believe that the problems that occurred that came to our attention last year were because it was not being consistently followed. Mm -hmm. um, and when brought to, the atten to Bob's attention, as appropriately it would be because um, the home education is approved by his office, um, he, naturally he referenced policy and this discussion has then ensued with the um, with the with the schools with the principals to say you know once brought to our attention if policy is not being followed we have to remind people and bring policy to their attention and and uh, implement so that's why this whole thing came up and I know I'm not answering your question directly but I can only say from the perspective of, of now being the superintendent faced with policy that was set, um, what was really our charge was to see whether or not there is compelling reason to change the current policy. So, um, oh, do you have more? I just have one follow up. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I hear you saying, and I just want, I want to make sure, because I, I think this is also based on the communication that we've gotten, um, this is not a change in our policy. This is something that we're, I, I guess, trying to add a definition to or do something to make it more clear to our administrators so that it's followed consistently, but no one views this as a change, or you don't view this as a change in the policy that we've had. Like it's, We're not all of a sudden trying to make it more strict. Mm -mm. We're trying to add a definition so that everyone knows how to apply it. Right, because the discussion that came up last year is what is extracurricular? Right, are are not are some of our specials that we call specials 
um, consider curriculum, and and that was where that discussion came from in terms of, you know, do we do we have a different value for um, non MCAS um, topic uh, subject areas, for example, and that opens another whole conversation clearly. So. I think that was part of our conversation as well, is that in order to define the current policy, we need to define what extracurricular includes. Okay, thanks. Do you have another question? I, yeah, I have a comment, but you can go ahead. So it's a question that I, I, so we're not changing the policy, but we know it's been applied inconsistently in the past. Correct. Are there any current students who are basically losing opportunity that they've had in the past right now? Is there anybody attending a class that's not able to anymore because of this? Because not, of our consistent application? Not that has been brought to my attention. Okay. Mr. Burlow? No. Did you want to add anything to my comment? No, I think okay. you did a great job. That's all I got. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> um, the only thing I wanted to say publicly, because Kathy, you and I had this discussion yesterday, and I, and I think it's a point that stuck with me after our last discussion as a committee on this, is I kept trying to understand why why having a homeschooled student attend a class was taking away from or potentially taking away from the other student's time or the teacher's time and and why the accountability would be necessarily unfair to other students in the class and I was not understanding that because in my opinion in my head I was thinking well if these students that are homeschooled had chosen to go to school we would be required to service them so what is the difference and what Dr. McLeod and I and she clarified for me yesterday which I didn't understand is that for any students that are not enrolled by October 1st the state doesn't provide any Reimbursement. reimbursement for those students because they're not an enrolled student. So if they are attending class, there is no reimbursement to the district for those students. Mm -hmm. um, the other point being that if they're not enrolled, are they, they're not being graded and they're not having, like, this, there's no attendance policy for them. Mm -hmm. So then if they choose not to attend class for a period of time and then they go back and attend class, they could potentially be behind where the other students are and then that teacher would be responsible for catching them up. Mm -hmm. um, so those were all points that I don't feel like came out very clearly in our last discussion and just for my purposes, I didn't understand them, and I, in case anyone else publicly didn't hear that or understand them, that made a little more sense to me because in my head, I saw it as, well, if these students had chosen to enroll in our school system, then we would have been responsible for them, so why not otherwise? Um, that, the, it's, I know it was just a discussion point, but I just felt like that needed to be. Thank you set for. Out on. for highlighting those those points I think I'd like to add that and I've said all along um, that as the superintendent is certainly my um, my hope to stay connected to the students who are being homeschooled and to have them feel part of our system and welcome within our schools within the schools their schools because they they live in this town um, families have have made decisions based on what they know best about their child and and we know that, that parents know best about what is best for their own students. Um, my hope has been through this whole discussion that we find ways to make students feel included and have access to um, being with other students and the social activities that take place through extracurricular activities uh, to include the things that you've all added this evening as well as um, sports, etc. To it, when we think of those kinds of things, they do not have the constraints that an academic or specials type of, of, of program would have around the things, Lori, that you just listed. So I believe there's a middle ground where we can provide absolute, not only provide but encourage access to students who are homeschooled, whose parents have chosen to homeschool them, to make them feel involved in the school program.
Is there any more discussion on this? Um, can I, can I ask one more question? And it might be, I think it's a data point we probably don't have just yet, but when I listen to the conversation that you and Lori had, and it doesn't, it doesn't come as a surprise to me because I think we've had a similar conversation. What um, we talk about, all right, and, and I, I believe and I tr understand that if we didn't, there's no policy with respect to attendance and there's no, they're not held accountable for their class, there, there can be issues. Do we have a data point on how many students have um, used the access that maybe was provided against policy, or just <laughs> policy? Do we? Oh. We, we don't no, actually. We have don't the data. have any of that information, Ellen. So we don't know if they came to school or didn't come to school. No, those aren't, wouldn't be records that we ever kept. Uh, okay. We kept all the re things that are required by uh, mm -hmm. by the state in terms of homeschool, what we approve, the curriculum they're going to use. Um, we don't keep records of for particular courses per se. Um, was it in, attended in the school? Was it something they did at home? Mm -hmm. That's nothing that I have access to, and I have all the records that we, you know, for, even for families that are no longer homeschooling. So, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. I did speak with Mr. Kernan today, and and there he he did say that there was a student, I, I want to say a couple of years ago, who had access to um, therapy through through an IEP. And so that's outside of this policy. I mean, a student right. who has an IEP and needs access to those kinds of services within the school would obviously have them. Um, you may be interested, because I was interested to note, that of the students who are being homeschooled, it's a pretty, pretty wide range. So within the yeah, K-5, right. so we have nine students K-5. We have seven students at the middle school level, grades 6 through 8, and another nine students at the high school level. Um, who are currently being homeschooled um, in our town. So I thought that was interesting to, you know, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know what to expect. I don't think I expected quite so many at the elementary level, um, but it's, um, it, it's pretty consistent across the grade levels in terms of, of students who are. And having, having spoken to the admin team about mm -hmm. this policy, have, um, and so with that range, I mean, it covers all our schools. Have, have any administrators come forward, said, you know, this worked really well in my school and this is why? Or has it, has it been, I guess, has it been an issue? How many, do we know if it's been requested? I mean, we know it's being requested now. And then now the, the therapy is a different issue because mm -hmm. an IEP is a different issue. Mm -hmm. So if that's like the prior access, it's very different than mm -hmm. um, why we're talking about this policy now. So, I, have people asked to access art in first grade? So, as Mr. Burlow said, we don't have oh, any don't evidence know. of that. But when we had the meeting with the administrators, this this was it seemed to be um, from what they were telling me, it seemed to be isolated. Okay. Um, that's not to say that everybody even knows to reference where the what the policy is. Um, and again, I, I said this before. Um, this was all with the best of intent, that, right? So people do, teachers do, guidance counselors recommend based on their best of intent. Um, and I believe with, with a lack of um, understanding or maybe even knowledge that there was a policy that was guiding these kinds of decisions. So That's a good point. I think you're absolutely right with that. Okay. Are we ready to move on? Any other comments or questions? I'm not clear on what you're asking me to do between now and next time. Oh, I think maybe, well, I won't speak for Jean, but I think some of the things were to address the, the well, enrichment think, programs. Yeah, and I think you and I both had suggestions for yeah. I've got them listed. Assemblies, programs. enrichment, field trips, And then beyond dances. that, I think, you know, we'd all be interested if you do receive any feedback from, right. from, from the from okay. that community. And that would be particular. feedback that would go to you because you were, we right. gave that in the letter so they could right. contact you. I might listen to my messages this week. I think just it's email. Just leave them your email. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. So now we're, we're going to try to address some of the additional items, right? Yes. With respect, okay. Um, and then we move on to school committee policy JF, which is the school admissions and residency policy, and it's up for a third reading. 
for consideration is the request and recommendation of the superintendent to revise the policy to limit non-resident admissions to a 30-day period from the start of the school year. Uh, the recommended mo motion is in the agenda. Move to adopt policy JF as amended. With one addition, Ms. Godino. Um, uh, the one addition would be under bullet two, intending to be a resident within, we would you, we would add the word, the, the written 30, and then put the number 30 in parentheses. If you see where I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, you know you don't have to do that. Well, it, it was only one through it was ten. Done, it's done elsewhere. <laughs> so okay. The 18 underneath it was done. It's consistency purposes. Okay. I don't, I don't. Does, does anyone oppose that revision? <laughs> okay. Um, so the recommended motion uh, is to move to adopt policy JF as amended during our meeting and as provided in the agenda materials. Does anyone have any comments on the motion? Someone like to make the motion? I move to adopt policy JF as amended. Is there a second? Motion by Ms. Nickerson, second by Ms. Knight. All those in favor? Yes. 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 Unanimous. Oh, Sorry, and so it carries. Yes. <laughs> Third reading. Don't bring it back. Okay, now we have time for, our, we're at our second public comment. <laughs> so this is the time when you're welcome to come up and, and um, you have you have, there's a three minute time limit. I will go very fast. Okay, you can have a seat. Right okay, Cam can hear you. Or wide TV audience. Oh, thank you. Only gets yeah. picked up by the microphone. And just introduce yourselves and. Yeah. I'm Joel Ankle Breyer. Um, we're home educators in Hopkins. I've been for the last eight years. So I've been through a couple rounds of this. Yeah. Um, I guess I came to say that our common goal with educating our kids is that we want to educate them well and that we want to use a variety of means to do that. So some of us that in the homeschool arena do look to the public schools to be able to have some options um, that are harder to supply at home. Um, so I guess we're curious is why the sudden need to define the extracurricular and what's the goal, I mean what is the bigger goal of limiting and have you I guess, have you asked homeschoolers what classes they would like to take if they were, I mean, if you asked us what we would like to take, because I have actually made phone calls over the last eight years requesting certain classes, and they're not the classes you're talking about. So it's usually art, choir, band, you know, it's those things that have to do in a big group setting. And those, because they're happening during school hours, are not an option. Mm. So I don't know many homes. I mean, I know a lot of homeschoolers are very integral in the, in the circuits, if you want to say. And I don't know many people that are asking for core subjects. You know, most, most homeschooling parents cover those very well themselves, or they're doing something else with that. So they're mm -hmm. looking for more of those group activities. Um, drama is another one that's big. Like a drama or drama. Uh, and some of those are after school, so that was could some be of those are. Point, yes. but some yeah. of them are not after school. So if you're defining extracurricular so strictly, then those courses are off limits. Mm -hmm. And I would define those as kind of the highest need courses because it's hard to have a choir with two kids, <laughs> you know. And um, you know, we we also appreciate I also want to say I appreciate some of the things that you said and being able to open this back up for comment and and you know we got the letter today Is actually in the mail. <laughs> um, we had gotten some emails that this might be happening so we came up and we okay, appreciate your, you. um, um, your comments earlier and that um, you know we we really want to be and you know we try to do as many things as we can to be part of the community and um, just because we choose to home educate doesn't mean we don't want to be part we don't have good friends that are in the right. school systems yeah. And, yeah. and we want to not only be enhanced but we also want to enhance because we have uh, different experiences and mm -hmm. we've home educated in three states now so mm -hmm. oh, wow. um, we've been in Indiana Pennsylvania and now in Massachusetts. Well that's another point so. we, I can go straight into just to open up a new top you know different states we've lived in 
if a homeschool student will take one course, there's states that get full funding. <laughs> There's states that get half funding. Yeah. I don't know what the options are there. I mean, so oh, yeah. there's some states, in Indiana in particular, very, very pro open the doors to homeschoolers because the funding is there. Mm -hmm. So I, well, I get that point. Yeah, and that's uh, that's something that I, was a question I had that you answered already. But if you're offering extra, I guess it's, I guess it's like the fine line. I understand you're trying to come up with that fine line of. But do you see how the classes we're asking I for do. are kind of not the courses you guys are really discussing? I felt like okay. Um, and I would I had it all in here. So like the letter with last minute. So glad that you decided. I mean we love that you decided not to make the policy change tonight to give you know everybody an adequate time to possibly come up and speak. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, you know homeschoolers yeah. are busy, and so <laughs> <laughs> to come up here at the last minute is really hard for them. Right. Sure. But yeah. So would the forum for them be August, October 8th? Yes. And that would be the same time? Yes. Hopefully not, actually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, ideally yeah. a little earlier. Yeah. Um, well, I just want to add to that, though, that the opportunity to email school committee members is any time and to contact any of us for purposes of providing comment is not limited to our meetings. So I, I, I at least want to make that clear that it doesn't have to wait until October 8th for you to voice opinions on it. But also that the standard meeting agenda has the public comment right at the beginning and then usually after we've gotten through old business. So no. It's not going to be right well, before the actually, policy no, discussion. Yeah, what she's saying is, it's, it, 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 particularly because it'll be the last reading next time, it would be to your benefit to be at the first. Right. You want to make sure you're here for the first one. Take our vote. Okay. So that's usually right after we open at but, seven. My but, last request would be to ask if some of the questions that were being asked over here were delightful to hear, just maybe more input from other school districts on why are some so open and mm -hmm. why are some not. Is mm -hmm. there, are they finding disadvantages? Are homeschooling kids in general, at least by experience, kids tend to be pretty responsible. <laughs> so if they are coming in for something in the general sense, we find the kids pretty well behaved. <laughs> they have committed parents who are involved and know what's going on. And I think mean, every educator loves to involve parents. So um, I don't know if you would find as many problems as maybe you think. I don't know. I'm just mm. curious to know why. Like, what's Ashley think of their policy? Mm -hmm. They have an open. And Framingham's pretty open. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shrewsbury's very open. A lot of school districts that are very open that are just right next to Hopkinton. Mm -hmm. So it's hard because we're all kind of in networks and we all kind of know the school districts and who does what. And it's like, well, why is Hopkinton, you know, closing the doors on some things? Mm -hmm. Are they finding funding somewhere? I don't know. You know. Okay. And one other comment that you made uh, that I actually thought was surprising is, as a parent, if I was going to send my child to one of the classes at the school, I would expect them to have the same dress policies and attendance policies and behavioral policies that every other student has. Mm -hmm. So I was kind of surprised that there was an issue with attendance mm -hmm. because I would have expected as a parent that we would be following the attendance policies at the school. Okay. So. As a homeschooler, I'm, I'm more than happy with that. Um, you know, I grew up in the public school system. Both my both my parents are teachers. My dad taught 43 years in, in uh, high school. And my mom taught 28. My aunt's 43, 43 years in first grade. So I've a, I actually taught college algebra. So we have a lot of education in our background. And, uh, you know, we value a lot of things that are happening in the schools, and we want to be part of that. So. Um, anyway, we would just want to continue mm -hmm. the conversation and be a resource of, you know, what do we need? Oh, we'll go, yeah. <laughs> We've got all kinds of good ideas. And if you have concerns, my job is to help make solutions just like I do at work and with our family and just like you guys are so I appreciate the time. And um, Mr. and Mrs. Briner, is that yes. correct? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, 
and I also wanted to share the same sentiment, which is thank you for not um, making a decision tonight. It's nice to have a little time to dialogue and think. Um, I guess I wanted to say that I think there might be some kids who would be affected differently with the change in the policy, the way you're thinking of changing it. Um, by defining extracurricular. I guess we don't know yet what it might be, but as it was in the packet for tonight to amend it to say outside of school hours, that would be a change um, from what was happening last year for um, extracurriculars, for um, school assemblies, and for field trips. So it would be a direct, a direct effect from the current situation. Um, yeah, I also agree that it's really unfortunate to have this whole idea of the state giving the towns back some money for children. And then my question is, well, what about a child who's pulled part year? So the reimbursement has already come to the school. So would it be the case that somebody who starts homeschooling in each year, would they get different things? <laughs> you know what I mean? If the school system has gotten money for it, I don't think you have to give it back partway through the year. Um, and then just out of curiosity, I suppose I should do some homework. I'm just curious to know when you look at the per pupil spending in a school district, where money comes from, what part do taxes pay that everybody in town pays for taxes for the schools versus what the state pays for reimbursement and how that might look in a town like Hopkinton, I thought we might be kind of on the short end of um, receiving money from the state, but I just don't know and maybe, maybe you all know. I want to take your time. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, I don't know that I can do much better after the <laughs> presentation of our friends here. Um, I, and I, I'm not a public speaker. Um, <laughs> yeah. But I think it seems to me that the original uh, provision that's in the document um, seems to have mirrored state, the state requirement that something be provided to homeschoolers. And it's a minimum bar, mm -hmm. not a cap. It's up to the discretion right now of each individual administrator what to do. Um, you know, above and beyond that part. It's not, it, it, I don't think it was intended. It was intended to serve the public and to protect the public right. So it obviously there are other towns who do this, so it doesn't prohibit doing something beyond that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, in the same vein, this, this motion to try to constrain it further, well, it simplifies things, and I understand that. I understand there are complexities that come with this. Um, it's not serving the public interest, in my opinion, to put further constraints on it, because it doesn't fit the spirit of the intent of the original um, provision. Um, I have lots of other thoughts, but I'll save them for another time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So are we ready for items by consensus? Yes. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the operating budget and other funds warrant number 16-001 in the amount of $399,314.97. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve the high school student activities warrant number 16-012 in the amount of $48,595.83. The superintendent recommends the school committee vote to approve $19,079 from the Sky's the Limit fundraiser be placed in the middle school gift account as indicated in the agenda materials. Second. Oh. second. Motion by Ms. Birchman, second by Mr. Graziano. Excuse me, all those in favor? Yes. Yes, yes. yes unanimous and so carries. Now <clears throat> we'll move into executive session to discuss contract negotiations with non-union personnel with respect to the superintendent's contract and to review executive session minutes for release 
and also to uh, receive or discuss updates with respect to the collective bargaining with the HTA. So I'd seek a motion to go into executive session and will we will adjourn from there. We'll, we'll yeah. just adjourn for the purpose of, uh, we'll re-enter we'll re it for the purpose of adjourning. Is what it's mm -hmm. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. Nickerson, second by Ms. Birchman. Roll call? Yes. Ms. Birchman, yes. Mr. Graziano? Yes. Ms. Knight? Yes. Ms. Nickerson? Yes. And I'm a yes. And the time is. One, two, one.